Hey guys, Rob here with McDojo Life. In today's McDojo Breakdown, we're going to talk about a story that involves accusations of stalking and harassment by a martial arts instructor. But not only that, we'll be interviewing two out of the three parties involved. Let's check out the story and let's break it down. Now, before we get to those interviews, I want to make sure that I catch you guys up to speed so that way you have all the context you need to understand what the interviews are even about. This is Carl Massaro. Carl Massaro is a fourth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Henzo Gracie. He's the owner and head instructor of Henzo Gracie Northern Valley. This is Maggie Holmes. Now, Maggie and Carl originally met each other on an app called OKCupid. Okay they met when she was 18 and he was 40. Now, they dated for about a year before she eventually decided that she was going to start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with Carl. They dated for about four years total before eventually splitting. Now, all the information I just gave you is pretty benign. There's not really much to it. But when you start actually scratching the surface of their relationship, it was pretty toxic by both accounts. Both of them admit it was not a very healthy relationship. But things came to a head when I start the timeline I'm about to give you on May 20th. So let's go through that timeline. On Friday, May 20th, the Rear Naked Chicks podcast released an episode with a full interview with Maggie. During that episode, she goes into great detail describing her relationship with Carl and how it was very dysfunctional. If you get the chance, I highly suggest you listen to it so that way you can hear her full version of the story. Now, the same day that the Rear Naked Chicks released that podcast episode, they also released this video. Hey guys, my name is Maggie and I'm here to tell my story about being abused by a Hunter Gracie black belt. I'm at Carl Massaro, who owns Hunter Gracie Northern Valley, when I was 18 and he was 40. We dated for about four years, and during that time, he abused me physically, sexually, mentally, and emotionally. When I finally did have the courage to leave him, he stalked me for months until I got the police involved. He also stalked my now fiance, and he had us banned from all of the local Henso affiliates, and my fiance was kicked out of Henso Gracie Middletown. I think it's important to call out abusers in Jiu Jitsu, especially ones who teach and own schools, because they are in a position where they have the trust and access to women, and they are supposed to be teaching these women to defend themselves and protecting them. I hope that this video will help other women come forward and talk about their abuse because I know that, especially in our community, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, thank you to the Rear Naked Chicks for letting me come on their podcast and tell my story. I hope you'll give it a listen. On Monday, May 23rd, they posted a follow-up clip of that podcast on their Instagram. Here's the following clip. When we were dating, I was less than 100 pounds. I'm five feet tall and tiny. He's a jiu black belt. So he knew he couldn't, like, seriously physically injure me and escape notice. Right. You know? But he would sexually abuse me. He would... Am I allowed to say rape? Yeah. Um, he would sexually abuse me. He would rape me. He would... A lot of it was verbal. You know? He would come home and... If he was mad about, like, he didn't like a dress I wore one day. He called me a whore and a slut for, I'm not exaggerating, hours. On Tuesday, May 24th, the next day, they released another clip. But it wasn't, I mean, the scariest part, I think, in all of these kinds of relationships is leaving, right? I mean, while I was yeah. there, I took a lot of shit and it sucked. But when I left him, it was like the scariest. So, like, if I was sitting at an outside bar having a drink, he'd drive by and he'd stick his head out the window and just look. Like, like basically saying, like, I want you to see me. I want you to know I'm watching you. I want to scare you. That's so scary. Dude, it was awful. And then I would like be, I was a waitress at the time and my coworkers come in and be like, he's outside in his car just sitting there, just behind the restaurant, just Jesus. sitting there. And then, but when I got off shift, he'd be gone. Right. But Whoa. he just wanted me to know that he was like there at all times. And he would drive by my parents' house like in the middle of the night and I would catch him. The reason I would catch him is because I was partying. So I would get home in the middle of the night and I'd see his car flying by. And I'm like, how many times a night did you pass in front of my parents' house? Like, are you doing this all no night? No wonder he doesn't teach. The man needs sleep. And yet again, on Wednesday, May 25th, they released yet another clip. Like, there was no internet presence of this relationship, but we were, like, hanging out, you know. Um, and because Carl was physically stalking me, he knew about him. And he, so he started Jesus. texting me. The most ominous text message I got was he would say things like, who are you seeing? Who are you seeing? And I, most of these texts, I never even answered. And then one day I'm at work and I get a text and all it says is Ray Wisniewski, which is the name of my fiance. Just single text from him, Ray Wisniewski. Like a threat. I know who he is. The following day, Thursday, May 26th, they actually released a compilation video of a whole bunch of text messages, screenshots that they had uh, between Carl's interactions with Maggie. Here's the clip.
Uh, up to this point, I wasn't made aware that any of this was even going on. Until Saturday, May 28th. On that day, I actually did receive an inbox message with the link to that particular post. So I shared it. I also got a hold of the Rear Naked Chicks podcast. And when I spoke with those ladies, they actually sent me an entire Google Drive full of documentations, videos, police report, uh, eyewitness testimonies, text messages, all kinds of things in that document uh, that backed up what Maggie had to say. The same day I reshared that particular post, the ladies posted up two more posts on the Rear Naked Chick IG. Now, up to this point, Carl hadn't said anything publicly, to my knowledge, um, on his Instagram page about the incident until Sunday, May 29th, where he released this public statement. I have been made aware of very serious and false allegations recently made against me. These false allegations clearly make for good clickbait and have helped monetize and drive traffic to a podcast and Patreon account that had, until now, found very little of an audience. At the outset, I would like to state very clearly I have never engaged in physical or sexual abuse of any woman and emphatically denied these slanderous and defamatory statements. These allegations stem from an adult woman, not a student, with whom I had a consensual romantic relationship from March of 2014 when we met on a dating app called OkCupid until we broke up in April of 2018. Heavily edited screenshots do not provide any insight into the truth of what transpired in the aforesaid relationship. There is, however, no denying it was a toxic and unhealthy pairing for both of us, and accordingly, we have had no contact in approximately four years. As a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructor who has managed a reputable academy for over 14 years, I have proudly taught countless female students and never been the subject of any complaints or investigations into my professional conduct. I am honored to teach an art that was designed primarily through leverage and technique to empower the small in physical stature and help people defend themselves. In my professional relationship, I have always understood and deeply honored the importance of clear consent. I condemn violence against women in all forms. Although I am deeply troubled by this unwarranted and utterly false attack on my character, out of the respect for the sensitive nature of public discussion related to intimate partner abuse, I will not make further public comment on this matter, which I have referred to my attorneys for further investigation and action. I know the individuals making these false claims are for their own financial benefit, hoping to prolong the 15 minutes of fame they have created with the lies. Those hopes, like their professional energies, are sadly misplaced. I refuse to fan the flames of enrangement engagement on social media by providing a point-by-point -point refutation of the demonstrably false statements they have made against me. Approximately 81% of women will experience intimate partner abuse in their lifetime. There are real victims of real intimate partner violence and coercive control that deserve our attention and assistance as a community. Rather than donating to the Patreon account of lying charlatans, I would encourage everyone to consider donating instead to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence at www.ncadv.org or other similar and well-deserving organizations. I appreciate very much the overwhelming outpouring of support I have received in recent days from the many friends, students, and colleagues who know the truth of who I am. With love and gratitude, CM. The Rear Naked Chicks podcast posted their rebuttal to that statement, which stated the following on the same day.
another thing that happened on that day is I had reached out to Carl myself and let him know that I'd be covering this story and wanted to know if he wanted to make some type of a public statement. Of course, other than the statement that he already made, a statement specifically for the story. He let me know that he appreciated me reaching out and he let me know also that he was working on a detailed statement that he would be providing to me. He also let me know that if I intended on moving forward with the report, that he would hope that I would wait for his detailed statement before doing so and perhaps review the facts and evidence he has to demonstrate this situation was not as alleged by Maggie, Jordan, or the Rear Naked Chicks podcast. Now, he never actually provided me with any evidence, but he did, on the other hand, provide the statement that he said he would provide on June 4th. And here's what the statement had to say. I intended my May 29th, 2022 statement to be my final public comment on the false allegations and defamatory statements recently made against me on social media. Unfortunately, the authors and publishers of these slanderous statements continue to attempt to drive traffic to their social media accounts, podcasts, and Patreon donation platform by making further false allegations and amplifying the prior false claims. I have now received inquiries and requests for further comment by several larger and well-respected media outlets that are popular within the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community. The professional community where I've built my business and positive reputation for the past two decades. While I am loath to give further attention to these false allegations and the disingenuous motives of those who originated them, I believe several important points should be carefully considered by any media outlet that wishes to report on this controversy. The false allegations made against me are rooted in statements of two individuals, neither of whom have ever been registered students at my academy, Maggie Holmes and Jordan Novak. The following are a list of key points related to both of these individuals regarding their relation to each other in my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Maggie Holmes. We met on a dating app, OkCupid, okay and were in a consensual relationship for approximately four years. While there is an age gap between us, approximately 20 years, we were both adults over the age of 18 when we began dating. I believe that adult women have the authority and agency to decide whom they wish to date. I further believe it is misogynistic and condescending for anyone to suggest that Maggie, or any adult woman, is too immature to decide what age range they find individually acceptable for their own romantic partner. Maggie had never trained Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at the time we met. For the first year of our relationship, she did not come to my academy nor train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. After approximately one year into our relationship, organically, and in within the larger context of our relationship, Maggie expressed an interest in coming to my academy to spend time with me and to see if she might enjoy training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I enthusiastically supported this, primarily because I thought BJJ would help her as it has countless other women, providing her with camaraderie, confidence, and practical self-defense knowledge. My love for BJJ is a big part of my personal and professional life, and I appreciated having a romantic partner who wished to learn more about it. Maggie was never a student at my academy. Maggie never paid any fees or membership dues to my academy. The relationship between Maggie and I ended in late April, early May of 2018. My last attempt to contact her was late June of 2018. In contrast, after Maggie made at least 10 unsuccessful attempts to call me, including a FaceTime that wasn't answered between November of 2018 and March of 2019, our last direct contact was in March of 2019 when Maggie called me and in essence yelled at me and blamed me for her boyfriend being kicked out of another BJJ academy, not mine. I asked her not to contact me again and hung up. She ignored that request and attempted to call me again shortly thereafter. I did not answer the call. I maintained proof of her attempts to contact me on my phone. Maggie and I were in a relationship for approximately four years. It was in retrospect a very unhealthy relationship. It was my first serious relationship after my divorce and the first where my children, who were young at the time, had been introduced and grown close to my romantic partner. During that relationship at various points, Maggie and I both communicated with each other in an unhealthy way, demanding to know each other's whereabouts, suspicious of the other cheating, and vacillating quickly between telling each other we never want to see the other again, thereafter resuming our relationship as if nothing had occurred. It is improper to characterize my behavior as stalking or harassment, as both of those terms have a specific legal definition that is inapplicable to the reality of what transpired here. My attempts to contact Maggie were always with a legitimate purpose, initially to attempt to fix a broken relationship, 
particularly in light of my children's affection for Maggie, two girls who were four and seven at the time, who suddenly and without explanation lost any and all contact with Maggie and her parents and family with whom we were close and who had been present in my children's lives for many years. I have never stalked Maggie. Stalking is defined by the New York State Penal Law, Section 120.45, and has a specific legal definition, essentially engaging in repeated, seemingly obsessive, and unwanted behavior towards another person, with no legitimate purpose, and, as a result, causing the other person to feel emotionally, mentally, or physically threatened. I did not have any intent to harass, annoy, alarm, or intimidate Maggie. The only communication I had with Maggie that could arguably constitute harassment was the angry, nasty text I sent to her in June of 2018 when I learned she was in a new relationship. It was an immature response to our breakup and learning that she was dating someone else. I regret that text, but ultimately I don't believe it fits the definition of any criminal conduct and was merely an expression of upset. I would note that this text did not contain any threats towards Maggie, nor any abusive language towards her, e.g. insulting her or calling her any profane names or words. I was insulting towards her new boyfriend. Again, it was immature, and I regret it, but ultimately I believe many people do foolish, immature things when going through a breakup after a long-term relationship. This was not criminal conduct. In contrast, during our relationship, while verbally abusing me and or threatening suicide or other self-harm, Maggie would frequently tell me that she wanted me out of her life and or to never speak to her again, only to thereafter reach out and make contact with me, later telling me that it was hurtful to her when I gave up on attempting to contact her after she had previously told me not to contact her. The audio recording Maggie recently made public, which was published by Jordan on Rear Naked Chick's Instagram and other social media accounts, was a recording of a voice message left for Maggie in 2018 by the Warwick Police Department. The call referenced in that message by the police that was made to me by the police was, at that time, the first and last time the police contacted me. After I received the request from the Warwick PD, I did not contact her again. Looking back and with benefit of hindsight and distance, it is clear that Maggie and I had an unhealthy relationship. It was my first long-term relationship after a contentious divorce, and although I believe both Maggie and I entered into the relationship with good intentions and optimism, we remained together longer than we should have. Although I am terribly hurt by the false allegations Maggie has made against me, and confused as to why she would make them, I harbor no ill will towards her, and before these recent events, was happy that we both appeared to have moved on to new relationships and new chapters of our lives. Jordan Novak. Jordan is the host of the Rear Naked Chicks podcast and is in a romantic relationship with Maggie's brother, who also trains at RG Warwick along with Jordan and Maggie's friends on Rear Naked Chicks podcast. Jordan has never been a student at my academy. Jordan has never been... Jordan has never paid membership dues to my academy, nor have I ever been her formal instructor, other than her attending a drop-in class at my academy. I have never stalked Jordan, nor attempted to make any romantic overtures towards her at any time. While Jordan claimed in a recent podcast episode that I followed her into the woman's changing room at my academy, this is entirely false. At no point in my professional career at my academy or any other have I ever followed a woman into a locker room. My program director, instructors, as well as male and female students can attest to our conduct and rules in our school regarding this. No male is allowed in the woman's locker room while a female is in the building. If we need to enter the woman's locker room to close the academy, after all females have left the building, we knock to make sure no one is in there. While Jordan claimed in a recent podcast that I showed up at another academy, R.G. Warwick, where she was teaching a children's jiu-jitsu class on multiple occasions, Offering this in support of the suggestion that I was stalking her, she conveniently failed to mention that my two children were, in fact, enrolled students at the academy at the time, attending the class, and that I was there accompanying them. My children were enrolled there because I live much closer to R.G. Warwick than I do my own academy. While Jordan claimed in the podcast that I kept tabs on when she trained at my academy, she fails to realize that as the owner of an RG Academy, it is quite common for owners to want to monitor any drop-ins from other schools, especially RG-affiliated academies. I often ask my instructors and program director to promptly advise me if anyone, including male students, drop in from any other schools, or if any potential new students slash prospects come in to train. 
Jordan's claim that I showed up at my own school on days I didn't teach in order to stalk her is absurd. Since I founded my school approximately 14 years ago, I frequently show up there to do work, repairs, clean, train, etc. I have had a total of one text exchange and six IG message exchanges with Jordan in my lifetime. The most recent in August of 2019. In both text and IG messages, she reached out to me first. None were flirtatious in nature. All were cordial and appropriate. I maintain screenshots of all of these interactions. Documentary evidence. I maintain an array of screenshots, text messages, social media posts, video, and audio recordings that both A, belie the credibility of the allegations made by Maggie and Jordan, and B, document the verbal and physical abuse perpetuated by Maggie against me during our relationship. I have, to date, declined to release these materials in my defense of these allegations for a number of reasons. I do not wish to see these false allegations amplified by further engagement on social media, whether in support or repudiation of those allegations. I do not believe Jordan or anyone else should profit from the pain of others. I do not wish to violate Maggie's privacy by releasing for public viewing video and audio recordings that would embarrass her or cause her any emotional harm. While I have a variety of recordings that document Maggie's suicidal ideation, suicidal gestures, self-harm, cutting herself and striking herself, and her verbal and physical abuse of me, it was my hope that Maggie has moved on and was in a better place in her life emotionally, and like me, would like to put our toxic relationship in the past. I maintain two video slash audio recordings of Maggie explicitly threatening to make false claims against me of physical abuse. There are also recordings of Maggie striking herself, threatening to kill herself, and verbally abusing me. These recordings were made in the middle and near the end of our relationship, and although Maggie never made good on those threats until now, I retain the recordings in an abundance of caution. Legal Action In recent social media postings, Jordan and or Maggie have attempted to argue that if I wish to refute their false claims, I should sue them. These arguments are illogical and demonstrate a complete lack of understanding of how the legal process works in matters of this kind. Unlike Jordan and Rear Naked Chicks, I neither have a podcast nor a social media presence that I am seeking to monetize and or publicize. Both positive and negative publicity related to this dispute will still ultimately drive traffic to the podcast and social media accounts of individuals who have made false allegations against me. While Jordan and Rear Naked Chicks podcast purport to be attempting to raise awareness of issues of domestic violence and coercive control, I would respectfully disagree. I believe, in sharp contrast, they are victimizing Maggie in their efforts to virtue signal and publicize their previously obscure podcast and social media presence, while at the same time attempting to ruin my good standing in RGA and hopefully get her back in RGA in the process. If they continue to attempt to make viral the lies they have published about me, I will have no choice but to release the aforesaid documentary evidence, including audio and video recordings, that will undoubtedly cause Maggie, not Jordan, embarrassment. If I am forced to prove my innocence, I will be forced to prove Maggie's dishonesty, which I am advised by my attorneys could make difficult or potentially even preclude Maggie's ability, when she graduates from law school, to be admitted as an attorney. Conclusion. The allegations made against me are false. In hindsight, my error was trying to communicate in an attempt to repair a broken relationship with a woman that myself and my children cared for. While I understand and appreciate the importance of giving voice and attention to the issues of intimate partner violence and coercive control, this story is simply not one that accurately represents an example of that all-too-common dynamic. I would respectfully urge you to refrain from amplifying this false narrative any further as it is demonstrably false and will serve no purpose but to further damage my personal and professional reputation. Thank you, CM. Now, there are definitely some things in that statement that are just flat out lies, and we will actually get to that in a moment. But first, something happened after that that kind of baffled me. Roughly about two weeks later, Friday, June 17th, I received this letter from the lawyers over at Norris McLaughlin, PA. Attorneys at law. The letter says that these attorneys represent Carl Massaro, Henzo Gracie Northern Valley, and the Henzo Gracie Association. And while I can't really go into a lot of detail about what the letter has in it, I can let you know that words like uninformed, inaccurate, baseless, and false, and other words like that are riddled in this letter. But my favorite part of the letter has to be the ending sentence. It's like, it's my favorite part of the letter. 
We are authorized to take any legal action necessary to address the wrongful conduct identified herein. Be guided accordingly. So of course, I had to send this to my lawyer who was a complete shark and he did. He guided me accordingly and he let me know what I needed to do and how I needed to move forward. So with that said, here's what I think about your letter. Before we finish with that, a little hand sanitizer. We're good to go. I think I kind of got a pee. Much better. Don't you find it odd that two weeks after he sent me his public statement, that he would have his attorney send me a letter that said that they are authorized to take legal action. Doesn't that seem a little odd? As you can see from what I thought about that letter, clearly I'm moving forward with the story anyway. So with that said, you can't intimidate me, you can't bully me, and you can't scare me away from doing this story simply because it hurts your feelings that I'm telling people the truth. Let's go ahead and get to the interviews with the ladies. I'll be going step by step with the ladies themselves who Carl has addressed in his letter um, and see their side of the story. Now, I did offer Carl to come on and to do an interview, but he just left me on red, so I guess that's a no. But definitely stick around for after the interview so that way you can get my final thoughts because they go into great detail about the bullet points of the things that he just said that were not true. Um, so my name is Maggie. Um, I dated Carl Massaro when I was, I started dating him when I was 18. And I broke up with him for the last time when I was 24. So this breakup was uh, a little bit over four years ago. Um, and I have just decided now to kind of come out and say like everything that he did to me and what happened between us, because I felt like almost obligated to kind of just like make people aware of who he is. Um, just so that they would know. Because when I met him, I didn't meet him in jujitsu. I met him on a dating app. But even, you know, in and outside of jujitsu, when you meet someone, you don't necessarily know like what their past is and the things that they've done. And when you're in a position to basically have the trust of, you know, everyone, but also women and young women, I, you know, I would want to know if I was going to an instructor who had this history. So I decided to do that podcast on the Naked Chicks and just kind of put it all out there. Yeah, and obviously this is not that podcast, nor am I associated with those women whatsoever. But at the end of the day, I did get the chance to speak with them and I did get a chance to speak with you. And I was provided a lot of evidence. And that was one thing that really made me want to do the story more than anything else is that I did get a lot of evidence that was provided to me, um, not just from you, but also from them. Um, it was very concise. It was very thorough. It wasn't hearsay. Um, I did get a chance to speak with Carl about the issue, and I want to dig in to the questions and all that good stuff. This part directly is about you. It says Maggie Holmes, and these are all bullet points. Uh, we met on a dating app, OkCupid. Okay We're in consensual relationship for approximately four years, which you also agreed it was about four years. Um, correct? Okay. Um, while there is an age gap between us, approximately 20 years, we were both adults over the age of 18 when we began dating. Also confirmed by you that that was true. I believe that adult women have the authority and agency to decide whom they wish to date. I further believe it is mis uh, misogynist uh, to and condescending for anyone to suggest that Maggie or any adult woman who is too immature to decide what age range they find individual acceptable. Uh, acceptable for their own romantic partner. Not sure how that actually applies to what we're talking about here, but okay. Uh, Maggie had never trained Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at the time we met. For the first year of our relationship, she did not come to my academy nor train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Would you say that's also true? Yeah. Okay. After approximately one year in our relationship, organically uh, and within the larger context of our relationship, Maggie expressed an interest to come and coming to my academy to spend time with me and to see if she might enjoy training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I enthusiastically supported this primarily because I thought BJJ would help her. And as it has 
had as it has with countless other women, providing her with the camaraderie, confidence, and practical self-defense knowledge. My love for BJJ is part of my personal and professional life, and I appreciated having a romantic partner who wished to learn more about it. Um, Maggie was never a student of my academy. Now, that is something that I, I can completely disagree with. I have seen you in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Gi. I have seen you in photos of attending classes. Now, whether you were a paying member of the facility or not does not mean you weren't a student of the facility. A student is someone who goes to a facility to learn from a teacher. If you were ever in that building and you ever learned jujitsu in that building, at that moment, you were a student. Whether you were pro bono or not is different, but still you were there, you were taking classes. Is that correct? Yeah, I, again, I'm not sure. I like, I never paid, you know, um, but I did sign in on the attendance sheet every class that I attended. And I, I don't know why he thinks whether or not I paid for those classes is really relevant here, but yeah, I mean. But you did attend classes. Yeah, I attended classes. I did my whatever attendance time card every time I attended classes, but I, I never signed a contract nor paid for it because I was his girlfriend. So you were pro bono. You were there for free, but you were still in attendance and the capacity of a student who was trying to earn rank. Right. Correct. Okay. So you did, again, just making sure that that's very clear. Just because you didn't pay doesn't mean you weren't a student. It yeah. just means you weren't a paying member. Right. Um, and so that is, to me, is a false misrepresentation in all honesty, because just because you weren't paying doesn't mean you weren't actual attending in a class. Like, that's just ridiculous to me. But that's just my personal opinion. Um, but I just want to make sure that it's very clear because to me, that is a very much a false statement. Now, if it had said you were not a paying member, that would be different because that is hundred percent true. You were not a paying member, but you were very much someone who attended classes regularly. How often do you think you took, you actually took classes? I mean, it, it would really depend on what was going on, but there were, you know, definitely periods of time where I was going four times a week. I mean, he gave me my blue belt after two years. So it was definitely a reg, you know, I went every week, at least a few times. Okay. So you, again, so since you received rank, that would make you a student. <laughs> like that's pretty common sense. Now the next statement continuing down this, this letter that he's given um, is basically exactly what we just talked about. It said, Maggie never paid any fees or membership dues at my Academy, which is something that we all agree with. You did not pay that, but that does not mean you weren't a student. It means you weren't a paying member. Uh, so we continue. The relationship between Maggie and I ended late April, early May of 2018. My last attempt to contact her was June of 2018. Would you say that is correct? Pretty much. I think I broke up with him the very end of March. And then the last contact was late June. So that's relatively accurate. So something about that. All right, cool. Um, in contrast, oh, sorry. In contrast, after that, Maggie made at least 10 unsuccessful attempts to call me, including a FaceTime that wasn't answered between November of 2018 and March of 2019. Our last direct contact was in March of 2019 when Maggie called me and, in essence, yelled at me and blamed me for her boyfriend being kicked out of another BJJ Academy, which he says was not his. I asked her not to contact me again and hung up. She ignored that request and attempted to call me again shortly thereafter. I did not answer the call. I maintained proof of her attempts to contact me on my phone. What would you say about that statement? So, again, partially accurate. So I never, I don't know what he's getting with between November and March. In February of 2019, so almost a year after we broke up, my now fiance, who was my boyfriend at the time, got kicked out of Henslow Gracie Middletown. And so I called him and basically said, you know, it has been however, almost eight months, almost a year since we broke up. Why are you still trying to interfere with my life? Why are you having him kicked out? And he said something like, oh, because whatever, I hate you or you ruined my life or like something, was something nonsensical and then just hung up on me. Now, I don't know if he answered on the first try when I tried calling him. So I might have called him several times in that like 10 minute span. But I never like outside of that, you know, that one night where I found out he had had him kicked out. I, I never contacted him. That was the one time. And that was in February. Mm. And again, as I stated before, I'm just trying to make sure I get all the facts because I'm, that's what I'm here for. But when it comes down to it, this was after um, which we haven't even gotten to yet. 
but we will get to. This is after that you had already asked the police to ask him not to contact you anymore? Yeah. So the police report was in June of 2018. And then in February of 2019 is when my boyfriend got kicked out of Hensel Gracie Middletown and I called Carl. So tossing it out there, do you think that that was probably not the smartest idea to try to contact him after you had already spoken with the police for him not to contact you? Yeah, for sure. Like it was, it was like, I was just so upset and surprised because I was like, it had been so long that to know that he was still, he even knew that my boyfriend trained there and was still like, you know, because my boyfriend had posted a picture of him at um, Henzo Gracie Middletown on Instagram, like the day or two prior. And then immediately they were like, oh, you can't train here because he was obviously still looking at his Instagram and then got him kicked out. So for me, it was just like, I was so angry that he was still trying to interfere with my life. Um, But yeah, it was a dumb thing to do for sure. Um, But it was just like, you know, I was just so shocked and angry about it that I just picked up the phone and started calling him for the first time in almost a year. Now, when it comes down to it, why did you contact him and not the actual facility instead? I don't, because I didn't even know what he told them. Like, and you know, my boyfriend was basically like, whatever, I'm not going to beg them to let me train there. If they want to believe whatever he's saying, I'm not going to, you know, argue with it. You know, I mean, he was upset too. And he was kind of just like, I've been training here and you're just going to take someone's word that you should kick me out. So that I'm also curious about that as well, because obviously you have some reason to believe that Carl was the reason for your boyfriend, now fiance, getting kicked out of the facility. What alluded to that being the reason that you assumed it was him that did that? Okay. So when we first broke up um, in the summer of 2018, one of his black belts was opening an academy in my hometown, Warwick. And my then boyfriend was interested in training there and my brother started training there. So I was also interested in training there. Um, and so it's owned by this guy named Dave Maver, um, who got his black belt from Carl. And there was kind of a lot surrounding that new school opening. I mean, Carl at one point alluded that he owned that school, um, which is not true. And then he told, told me in a text message to have my boyfriend come to that school, like implying that he wanted to fight him there. Um, and Dave like really wanted nothing to do with this whole craziness. And he was kind of just like, um, you know, I, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And then eventually, and I don't know really the timeline for this, but it came to my attention that the Henzo association had banned us. So I heard that from Dave And then also the owner of Henzo Middletown, um, I did end up confronting, you know, you said, why didn't you call them? Well, I ran into him in person at a restaurant Mm -hmm. and I walked up to him and I was basically like, dude, what, you know, what was that? Why did you kick my boyfriend out? And it was kind of funny actually, because when I walked up, you know, I had never, like I had met him in passing when I was dating Carl, but I didn't know him. But as soon as I walked up, he was like, oh, I know what you're, you want to talk to me about. And he said the same thing. He was like, it's out of my hands, the Henzo Association. And um, I know he did talk to the Henzo Association recently and basically said, yeah, Carl called me a bunch of times. Um, He said that the association had banned him. Um, And then there's also additionally another guy that I know that trained, used to train at Middletown, um, now trains at Warwick. And he said that he was present for the phone call that the owner BJ got when Carl was calling him saying that he should be kicked out. So it was kind of just like, you know, I knew it was him immediately because there was no other reason that Ray would have been kicked out. I had already heard Mm. from Dave Maver that there's this supposed ban. And then, you know, Carl openly admitted on the phone that it was him. He was like, I was like, why did you do this? And he's like, because I can basically. Mm. So, you know, it was just all that. I'm assuming (laughs) um, more than assuming, but did you feel that that was fair? To kick him out? Yes. No, I mean, this kid did. And I, you know, (laughs) I mean, I know none of this is my fault, but I put this kid through so much just to date me, you know, like he was also stalked and threatened and we weren't even really a couple yet. Like we were just casually seeing each other. He has never met Carl. He, you know, he doesn't know any of these people. He never did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So for him to like face this punishment just for dating me is unjustified. Continuing down the list of uh, the bullet points that he had to on his public statement, Uh, It says, Maggie and I were in a relationship for approximately four years. 
It was in retrospect, a very unhealthy relationship. It was my first serious relationship after my divorce and the first where my children, who were young at the time, had been introduced to and grown close to my romantic partner. During the, that relationship, at various points, Maggie and I both communicated with each other in an unhealthy way, demanding to know each other's whereabouts, uh, suspicious of the other cheating, and vacillating, I guess, I don't know, uh, quickly be, uh, between telling each other we were never wanting to see the other again and thereafter uh, resuming our relationship as, as if nothing had occurred. Um, what do you think about that? It's like partially true, but I feel like he's twisting it. Um, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's inaccurate, but you know, when you call a relationship unhealthy, that's a very generous way of framing what you put me through. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, well, just my interpretation of the statement. And this is just me. Obviously, I'm a third party, so I wasn't involved in your relationship, nor am I in any way. Um, but when it comes down to it, it just seems like this is a little more self-deprecating in the statement. I'm not saying that it wasn't worse, but obviously, whenever people make statements about themselves, they typically aren't making themselves seem like the bad guy most of the time. Because I don't believe that most people feel like they are the bad guy which is, makes it very hard to get to the truth sometimes when it comes down to relationships, especially when it comes to things like non-tangibles, things that you can't actually quantify with a letter or a writing or a screenshot. It's a feeling. And so obviously how you feel about that relationship is going to be different than how he feels about it, or at least how he is stating in a public statement. So at the end of the day, would you at least just say that it was unhealthy? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and now if you were to say that same statement, what would it sound like if you had written that instead of him? He, he I think, he, and sorry, I don't remember verbatim what his statement was, but he mentions like breaking up and getting back together. Um, and for me, that's like the thing that stands out is the way he frames it is a little bit bizarre because basically it was me trying to leave our entire relationship and him stalking me and, you know, going through this weird cycle of like, you know, I hate you. I'll kill you if you leave me to, you know, I love you. I'm so sorry. I'll change. And, you know, just very, this basically all of the behaviors that I did have documentation for at the, the last breakup had happened a million times before the stalking, showing up at my work, showing up at my house, you know, just sending flowers, texting from fake numbers like that. This was not the first time that that had happened. Um, and I had tried to leave him several times throughout the relationship and basically was just intimidated and bullied and begged until I broke down and came back. So, you know, to say that it was unhealthy um, and that we broke up and got back together a bunch of times, I don't think really accurately captures, you know, it wasn't like we got into a fight and broke up and then we forgave each other. It was like, you know, I think the longest amount of time we had broken up um, during the relationship was probably like a month. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing that I had post text messages of at the end of the relationship, just bombarded with texts, calls, gifts, like, you know, and being followed and being harassed and being stalked until I finally gave in and came back. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, that is, that's just the thing that stands out to me. It is improper to characterize my behavior as stalking or harassment as both of those terms have specific legal definition that it is, that is incapable to the reality of what transpired here. My attempts to contact Maggie were always with a legitimate purpose, initially to attempt to fix a broken relationship, particularly in light of my children's affections for Maggie, two little girls who were four and seven at the time, who suddenly and without explanation lost any and all contact with Maggie and her parents and family whom we were close and who, and who had a presence in my children's lives for many years. Now, this is something that we talked about just for a second before we got started here, which is, he says, it is improper to characterize my behavior as stalking or harassment. Now, with that said, this is a, you know, I'm sure that it'll come back again, but you actually not only um, have used the term stalking harassment, but it wasn't just you that used that term. The actual police report that was given for a certain incident, which I'm sure we'll get into in a moment, 
the police say in the statement that it was stalking and harassing. It's actually written by the police and they themselves characterize it as stalking and harassing. So that is just, I know for a fact, based off of what the police had written, that yes, it was considered stalking and harassing. Um, now, the only reason I can say that without any doubt whatsoever is because I have the police report. I've seen it. Um, and so to say, to downplay that it wasn't stalking and harassing, unfortunately, is just not true. That is an inaccurate statement whatsoever, because that's not just coming from you. That is not hearsay. That is not some random statement. It is stated as a fact in a police report labeled as stalking and harassing verbatim, I mind you. Um, would you say that there was more than just the one incident of stalking and harassing, as you kind of stated before? What type of issues would you say would con you consider stalking and harassing that he has done? I mean, again, this was several instances throughout our relationship whenever I would try to leave him. Um, there was, I mean, he would drive by my parents' house, like when I was home in the middle of the night and he would like slow down and like look to see if my car was there and if I was home. Um, he would show up at my job uh, a lot. <laughs> I had said to my managers, like, you know, please don't let this guy in the store because he was showing up because I wouldn't answer texts or calls and he would just try to talk to me at work. So the managers, you know, I, and I told him this, I, you know, I said, just, so you know, like if you come in again, like they're going to call the police, you can't just come into my work. Um, I think that the, I mean, the two, I mean, it's all crazy, but the two craziest times were he followed me to Brooklyn one time. Um, just for reference, I live about 55 miles North of Manhattan um, and I went to Brooklyn to visit a friend, um, during one of our breakups. It wasn't the final one. It was a different one. And I parked on the street and I get out of my car and he's there in his car. And he had followed me all the way from upstate New York to Brooklyn. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, how did you find me here? Um, and I don't know if he just physically followed behind me, which I think would be very difficult. Um, you know, driving through New York doing that, or if he put a tracker on my car, I don't know how he managed it, but he followed me to Brooklyn. Um, and then the other time that was a really long distance, I, I went to uh, Rhode Island, um, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, again, to visit a friend. And he showed up and he was same thing. He showed up in Rhode Island. That's like a three hour drive from where I live. And he had told me later on, cause I, I was like, how did you find me? And he's like, oh, I rented a car so that you wouldn't recognize my car behind you. Um, so, I mean, he was traveling, he was renting cars and traveling long distances to follow me um, just to see who I was with and what I was doing. And, you know, he would drive by, like if I was at a bar or restaurant sitting outside, he would drive and drive by. And the thing that, I mean, was, particularly creepy about it is that in a lot of these instances, he wasn't trying to hide. Um, like I specifically remember being terrified because I was sitting outside of a bar with my friend um, and he drives by and he slows down and he sticks his head out the window and just makes this like really prolonged threatening eye contact with me. Like he wanted me to know he was following me. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's stalking. Like I, you know, when you're behind me everywhere I go, I mean, I'll be driving and look in the rear view mirror and he's driving behind me just on my way home from work. And I think like a lot of it was him just wanting to know what I was doing and who I was with. And I always, but part, I think there was definitely an element of like, I want you to know that I know what you're doing because I want you to see me. I want to read this to you. And I think that this is kind of important because I want to make sure that you know, that obviously with most any definition of any word, there's several different definitions, but um, there's a couple that seem to all apply here. So that way, this is not just us assuming. Uh, if we go right to Merriam-Webster, um, actually, I'm sorry, the Oxford Dictionary, it says, pursue and approach stealthily. Well, I would imagine that if somebody is following you in a car, they are pursuing you. And if they followed you in a car that was a rental car, that would be considered stealthily, as in not trying to get caught. Yeah. Um, uh, another definition, stride somewhere in a proud, stiff or angry manner, which you stated he was making a threatening eye contact with you while you were driving. That would also apply. Another definition, stalking is defined as a pattern of un unwanted behavior directed at specific person, which causes that person to change their routine or feel afraid, nervous or in danger. Examples of stalking behaviors include repeated unwanted phone calls, texts, 
messages that may or not be threatening. Well, we have once again, definitive proof that that happened, not just from him, but from a police report stating that he himself admitted to using an app to change his phone number in order to continue to contact you in an unwanted way. So again, this is not some type of a guess. I am not guessing that this happened. There was a police report that states it. Um, and once again, in that police report, it's stated as stalking and harassing. So I want to make sure that in this particular statement that we're covering truths, just like when I asked you about making sure that, you know, did you think it was an appropriate thing to contact him after you had contacted the police for him not to contact you, you admitted that that was the wrong thing to do. That was not smart. I can tell you that wasn't smart. But guess what? That's something that happened. You admitted that it happened. Now here we have the other end of the coin where he's saying it wasn't stalking harassment. And as a matter of fact, the next bullet point literally says, I have never stalked Maggie. That is an utter, complete lie. Just period lie. Because I have a police report that calls it stalking and harassing. I have the definition of stalking and harassing, which literally says the words contacting somebody one more time. So that way I don't misquote here, a pattern of unwanted behavior directed at a specific person, which causes that person to change their routine or feel afraid, nervous, or in danger. Examples, stalking behaviors include repeated unwanted phone calls, texts, and messages. According to this definition, that is verbatim what has happened to you. So once again, yes, you did. <laughs> you did stalk the lady by definition. So uh, that's not even a question. Now we continue down the bullet point. Stalking is defined, <laughs> this is interesting, he actually leaves his own definition. Stalking is defined by the New York State Penal Law Section uh, 120.45 and has a specific legal, legal definition, essentially engaging in repeated, seemingly obsessive and unwanted behavior towards another person with no legitimate purpose as a result, causing that person to feel emotionally, mentally, or physically threatened. That is exactly what he did. That is, I agree, if that is the definition that he broke that rule, <laughs> he stalked according to his own definition. Yes, when you set up multiple phone call, uh, phone numbers through an app to contact someone who clearly has blocked you and does not want you to contact them, and you do so anyway, that is exactly what that is. That is creepy, and that would make anyone feel unnerved. Um, that is just a weird set of behavior. And as stated in that police report, which we will get to as well, that is exactly what the police report says, is that when confronted about doing that exact behavior, he had no answer. Um, when the police clearly let him know that that behavior was not okay, he had no answer. And we'll continue to go down that path here in a moment. But like I said, going, this is the only side of the story I have is literally his statement. So I'm just going through and being fair on both sides. It says, I did not have any intent to harass, annoy, alarm, or intimidate Maggie. Again, I do not agree with that. I think that when you purposely get an app to change your phone number multiple times, that you got the app. You know why you got the app? <laughs> that was with the specific purpose of harassment. Like you were contacted, said, don't contact me anymore, made multiple different phone numbers through this app to continue to contact the person. That's, that's harassment. And again, as stated in the police report, uh, and defined by the police themselves, it was harassment. Um, the only communication I had with Maggie that could arguably constitute harassment was the angry, nasty text. It only says one. I sent to her in June of 2018 when I learned she was in a new relationship. It was an immature response to our breakup and learning that she was dating someone else. I regret that text, but ultimately, I don't believe it fits the definition by any criminal conduct. It was merely an expression of upset. Uh, I would note that this text did not contain any threats towards Maggie nor any abusive language towards her, I, uh, i.e., uh, he says IG, but I'm assuming I, insulting her or calling her any profane names or words. I was insulting, I was insulting towards her new boyfriend. <laughs> Again, it was immature and I regret it, but ultimately I believe many people do foolish, immature things when they go through a breakup after a long-term relationship. This was not criminal conduct. Um, can you maybe speak on that? Because um, it seems like a very specific text message that you might be aware of. Uh, yeah. So the text he's referring to was the one that basically made me go to the police. Um, because again, like I had been through this before I had, you know, I was 
looking back on it, the stalking is much crazier than I even felt. Like at the time it was just a reoccurring norm in our relationship. Um, and I, I didn't really want to get the police involved, like partially because I was afraid that if I got the police involved, it would escalate like, and he would do something and he, you know, because he'd be angry about police involvement. Um, and then I, I was at work one day and I get a text message from one of the fake numbers. And the only thing that the text said was the name of my boyfriend. Um, and I mean, to me, that's a threat, right? Like you're basically just telling me that, you know, who I'm dating. And I, I assumed he did because again, he's physically following me. So he had, must have seen me with him. Um, but he found out his name somehow and he said, so he sends me a text with just his name. And then a little while later, he follows up with a very long text message. Um, just, I mean, basically shitting on this dude. And I mean, I think I probably have, do you want me to read it to you or? I, I, mean, I'm, I mean, if you have it, I'd be very curious. He sends me the text at 11 21 AM on June 24th, 2018 with just the name of my fiance. And just for reference, this is part of the text messages that were in those videos that the rear naked chicks posted. So a lot of them can be seen. Um, are you fucking kidding me? You went back to this piece of shit, an iron worker with a pot belly and bad taste. This is what you left me for. Don't you have any self-esteem or self-respect? Aren't you ashamed or embarrassed? You obviously hate yourself. This is part of your self-destruction. There's a lot of typos, but I'm going to read it as it's supposed to be read Go for it. Um, that you have been doing since you've been a teen. This guy is worse than Zed, Peter and Gabe by far. Those are, he's just listing Max boyfriends. Um, you're not 17 anymore. You're supposed to know better. You can get anyone you want and you choose this. You went from a man who owns his own business, who loved you and supported you and fucked you better than anyone has to this pile of dog shit. I guarantee I'm smarter than him. I make more money. I have a better education and I can fucking kick the shit out of him in a fight. You have seriously downgraded worse than before. What the fuck is the matter with you? Give him my number. I want to meet him face to face. Tell this fucking cunt to meet me. What the fuck is the matter with you? Aren't you embarrassed to be seen in public with this piece of shit? Don't you know you could get any guy you want? You think that is better than me? Well, he isn't. He has bad taste and everything. A guy who calls himself Money Ray. That was his like Instagram handle and makes bad wood burnings on pine. What is this wood shop in sixth grade? I've seen this type before the wannabe punk, AKA blue collar guy who's into serial killers, classic asshole. You're too young and experienced to see what kind of run of the mill asshole he is. My friend saw his Instagram and said, Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Carl. That is really embarrassing. He has bad taste in video games and plays games that sucked. Even when I was a kid, old games that sucked in the eighties and nineties, and he pays money for them. What a fucking moron. Shame on you. You treated me like shit and ruined me for this asshole. I treated you like gold. You even told me I was a good boyfriend and you leave me for this shit and ignore me. Something you promised you wouldn't do. So you ruin yourself by fucking disgusting assholes and you blame me for any bad grades that you get. Did you notice that you almost always break up with me or start fights with me two weeks before finals? It's easy to blame me in case you didn't do well. The reality is, is that you can do well when you usually do well. I've always believed in you. I've always guided you. Fuck you. You sicken me. I'm glad I saw this because now I'm nauseated when I think of you. You have been defiled and ruined. Leaving me for this piece of shit is the worst insult you could have possibly given me. It's worse than fucking the janitor. Your true nature of unkindness, self-destruction, and self-hatred has come out. You're not cool anymore. You're an asshole. And then he follows up from another number. This is now at 2.20 p.m. Him and I know the same people. Apparently, he is a fucking idiot. He puts on a tough guy exterior to guys and a nice guy exterior to women, but he's a fraud piece of shit. Then in all caps, you left me for that. I want to talk to him face to face. If he doesn't, tell him to come to Henzo Gracie Warwick. I would love to see him. You are heartless. You fucking killed me. When it comes down to the next part, it says the audio recording Maggie, Maggie recently made public which was published by Jordan on the Rear Naked Chicks Instagram and other social media accounts, was a recording of a voice message left for Maggie in 2018 by the Warwick Police Department. The, sorry, somebody tried to call me, leave me alone. <laughs> the, the call referenced in that message by the police that was made to me by the police was at that time, the first and last time the police contacted me. After I received the request from the Warwick PD, I did not contact her again. What are your thoughts on that? So the, the voicemail that they had posted from the police, um, 
was just them following up after I had filed my initial police report, um, saying that they had talked to him, um, and that they had told him to stay away from me. Um, and he did stop contacting me after that. So I had no contact with him until he got my boyfriend kicked out of Henzo Gracie Milltown. And at that point, you, he did not contact you. You contacted him. Right. Last two bullet points here. It says, looking back and with benefit of hindsight and distance, it is clear that Maggie and I had an unhealthy relationship, which he's already stated before. It was a uh, first long-term relationship after a uh, continuous divorce, uh, contentious divorce. And although I believe both Maggie and I entered into the relationship with good intentions and optimism, we remained together longer than we should have. Can you agree with that? Yeah. Next bullet point, last bullet point. This is, although I am terribly hurt by the fake allegations Maggie has made against me and confused as to why she would make them, I harbor no ill will towards her. And before these recent events was happy that we both appeared to have moved on with our new relationship and new chapters of our lives. But at the end of this letter, and I'll just read it through, it says documentary evidence. I maintain an array of screenshots, text messages, social media posts, video and audio recordings that both A, uh, uh, Beal, Beal? I don't, I don't fucking know, uh, the credibility of the allegations made by Maggie and Jordan, and B, document the verbal and physical abuse perpetuated by Maggie against me during our relationship. I have, to date, declined to release these materials in my defense of these allegations for a number of reasons stated in these bullet points. I do not wish to see the false allegations amplified by further engagement on social media, whether in support of repetition or of those allegations. I do not believe Jordan nor anyone else should profit from the pain of others. I do not wish to violate Maggie's privacy by releasing for public viewing video and audio recordings that would embarrass her or cause her any emotional harm. While I have a variety of recordings that document Maggie's suicidal in ideation, uh, suicidal gestures, self-harm, cutting herself and striking herself and her verbal and physical abuse of me, it was my hope that Maggie was moved on and was in a better place in her life emotionally, and like me, would like to put our toxic relationship in the past. Next bullet point, I maintain two video and audio recordings of Maggie explicitly threatening to make false claims against me on, of physical abuse. There are also recordings of Maggie striking herself, threatening to kill herself, and verbally abusing me. These recordings were made in the middle and near the end of the relationship, and although Maggie never made good on those threats until now, I retained the recordings in an abundance um, of caution. Legal action is the next statement. It says, in recent social media posting, uh, Jordan and Maggie have attempted to argue that if I wish to uh, refute their false claim, I should sue them. These arguments are illogical and demonstrate a complete lack of understanding of how legal process works and the matters of this kind. It's not true. I mean, you could sue anybody over anything. Um, unlike Jordan and Rare Naked Chicks, I neither have a podcast nor social media presence that I have. I am seeking to monetize or publicize. Both positive and negative publicity related to this dispute will stay ultimately dr uh, drives traffic to the podcast and social media accounts of the individuals who have made false allegations against me. Um, I don't, and to my knowledge anyway, I don't think that they have ever stated nor you have ever stated your intentions of putting the story was specifically for the reason of driving traffic or making money. I don't, I've listened to both podcasts. I personally have not seen that. If I missed it, um, maybe I did. Uh, but at the end of the day, I personally can't recall one time where neither yourself or any of the ladies from the Rear Naked Chick podcast have ever stated the intentions were to drive traffic and to get money. Never, to my knowledge. Uh, while Jordan and the Rear Naked Chicks podcast purport to be attempting to raise awareness of issues of domestic violence and coercive control, I would respectively disagree. Um, you can disagree all you want. <laughs> I mean, they, they haven't stated it. They haven't. Uh, I believe in very sharp contrast, they are victimizing Maggie in the efforts to virtue signal to publicize their previously obscure podcasts and social media presence. Uh, obscure would be uh, your opinion. Uh, while at the same time attempting to ruin my good standing in RGA and hopefully get her back in RGA in the process, which I, I don't know if you've ever stated that was your intentions either. If they continue to attempt to make viral the lies they have publicized, uh, published about me, I will have no choice but to release the af uh, uh, aforesaid documentary evidence, 
uh, including audio and video recordings, that will undoubtedly cause Maggie, not Jordan, embarrassment. If I am forced to prove my innocence, I will be forced to prove Maggie's dishonesty, which I advise to my attorneys could make difficult or potentially even in, uh, preclude Maggie's ability when she graduates from law school to be admitted as an attorney. Conclusion, the allegations made against me are false. In hindsight, my error was trying to communicate in an attempt to repair a broken relationship with a woman that myself and my children cared for. While I understand and appreciate the importance of giving voice and attention to the issues of uh, intimate partner violence and coercive control, this story, in quotes, is simply not one that accurately represents an example of that. All too common dynamic. I would respectfully urge you to refrain from amplifying the false narrative any further as it is to be demonstrated false and will serve no purpose uh, but to further damage my personal and professional reputation. Thank you, CM. What do you, you know, obviously in that statement that he made, um, it is very much a threat of legal action mm -hmm. uh, saying that if you continue to pursue the story that you will be basically, from what I can tell, he will release these videos and audio uh, messages um, or recordings that he has, sorry. Um, and that it's, you know, all of that would be very damning to you and it would be damning to your career. Um, that is, that, I mean, that's, that's very much a, a threat um, when it comes down to it. And I'd be curious what your thoughts are on that. Cause obviously he's saying that he has these, this video and this audio of, you know, you doing things like self-harm, uh, threatening to lie about him, things like that. I'd be more curious about the lying thing. Um, you know, I, I'm guessing that you know what these videos are, so maybe you could allude to what they are. I had heard through the grapevine that he was saying he has videos, he has videos. And I knew what they were. Um, and it's, you know, one of the reasons I had never spoken out against him is because he had these videos, which are essentially blackmail. Um, so when we were dating, um, one of the things he would do um, is he would make me hurt myself and he would film it. Um, oh, and pause. So he would make you hurt yourself. Could you allude or uh, can you kind of dig in a little deeper about that? So for example, he'd say, punch yourself in the face, punch yourself in the face. And this was always like after a fight. And it was, it was kind of like, it was kind of like a punishment. Like it was like a torturous punishment. Like I did something wrong and now I need to repent for it. And so he would direct me to like punch myself in the face and he would film me. Um, and partially, like I said, this is like a weird punishment uh, and control thing, but also partially it's like blackmail, right? Because he knows that like, I would be mortified if he would ever share these videos because it's super embarrassing. Um, and it does, I'm sure, make me look mentally unstable. Um, and this was kind of a pattern throughout our whole relationship. Like he would he would do things to try to convince other people that I was mentally unstable. Um, for example, like I found out after we broke up that so my parents were concerned about me because I was showing kind of the signs of abuse. You know, I wasn't talking to them anymore and I was kind of withdrawn and depressed. And so he went to my mother and he said to her, he's like, don't tell Maggie this. She wouldn't want you to know but she was molested as a child and she's just going through a lot right now trying to deal with that, um, which is not true. I was not molested as a child, but he kind of made up these stories to, to explain away the behaviors that I was exhibiting, which were signs of abuse, you know, the, the depression, the avoiding my family because I didn't want them to know what was going on and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so another thing he would do is he would make these videos of me hurting myself and he would film it. And I would just comply because I was afraid of him. And because, you know, I think probably on some level, I thought I deserved punishment because that it was that kind of like fucked up relationship. Um, and I, I didn't know if he still had those videos, but I knew that he took them for a reason and probably for blackmail, because if I ever came out and said like, this guy abused me, he could hold it over my head. Um, that being said, I, you know, context aside, if I just was suicidal and kind of, you know, unstable and I was hurting myself, um, I, I don't know 
how that would exonerate anything that he's done to me. Like it doesn't really follow that that would exonerate it, even if I was just unstable and hurting myself. Um, that doesn't take away the abuse. It doesn't take away the stalking. Like it, it doesn't explain it away. And, you know, I also think it's important to note that I have never, and I went into this on the podcast, I have never said like that I sustained injuries from physical abuse from him. So I had clarified that the physical abuse that he had done to me was restricted to like shoving or choking or things that doesn't, that don't, they're not injuries. They don't leave marks. So he couldn't sit there and say, oh, I was protecting myself and, you know, because she says that I gave her a black eye or hit her. Cause that's not never something I've accused him of. Um, so, I mean, again, it's just, it's the threats, it's blackmail. He, he wants me to feel scared that these are going to be released, which partially I am, you know, like, of course I am like, that's horribly embarrassing. You know, even if people like know the context. Well, I think that what you just said is kind of an important thing. I think that you yourself already know that these videos exist. You, I, I also have run into that when interviewing other people about this, that they kept saying, well, he has video. And I, every time I asked, have you seen this video? It was always either no answer whatsoever, or it was so-and-so, a friend of mine saw it. And it's, it's, it was always something like that. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, though, I can agree with what you said. I think that two wrongs don't make anything better for either part or like, for instance, do I think that, you know, you should be punching yourself on camera because you're being directed to do so by so-and-so? No, I do think that that's weird as shit. But at the end of the day, I wasn't there. I'm not a part of your relationship. I have no fucking idea what you guys were talking about. And I have no idea how things worked. And if there was a video out there of that, and he's threatening to release this video just basically for the sake of embarrassing you, um, and clearly stated that, you know, he already is aware that it itself could hurt your career. It seems like that's him admitting that he is threatening to try to ruin your career. If, um, which by the way, that's probably not the smartest thing he probably could have written down. Yeah. Um, but he did release his own statement also on his Instagram, which I will, you know, I'll, I'll read through just real fast, just because I want to make sure that I'm giving his side a voice as well, because it's not fair to only give your side. Um, but it says heavily edited screenshots do not provide any insight into the truth of what transpired in the aforesaid relationship. There is, however, no denying it was a toxic, unhealthy pairing for both us. And accordingly, uh, we have had no contact in a, a approximately four years as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor who has managed to uh, uh, manage a reputable academy for over 14 years. I have proudly taught countless female students and never been the subject of any complaints or investigations into my professional conduct. I am honored to teach an art that was designed primarily, though, uh, leverage and technique to empower the small and physical stature to help people defend themselves. In my personal relationships, I have always understood and deeply honored the importance of clear consent. I condemn violence against women in all forms. Although I am deeply troubled by this unwarranted and utterly false attack on my character out of, the, out of respect for the sensitive nature of public discussion related to intimate partner abuse, I will not make further public comment on this matter, which is not true because he quite literally gave me a statement to release to the public, um, which I have referred to my attorneys to further investigate and in action. Uh, I know the individuals making these false claims are for their own financial benefit, hoping to prolong 15 minutes of fame they have created with these lies. Those hopes, like their personal energies, are sadly misplaced. I refuse to fan the flames of enragement engagement on social media by providing a point-by-point -point refutation of the demonstrable false uh, statement they have made against me. Approximately 81% of women will experience intimate partner abuse in their lifetime. There are real victims of real intimate partner violence and coercive uh, control that deserve our attention and assistance as a community. You are one of those people. Rather than donating to the Patreon account of Lying Charlatans, I would encourage everyone to consider donating instead to the National Coalition of Domestic Violence, which isn't a bad idea. You can donate to wherever the fuck you want. It's your money. Uh, I appreciate very much the overwhelming outpouring of support I have received in recent days from many friends, students, and colleagues who know the truth of who I am with love and gratitude signed cm is there anything in that statement that you have any issues with or is there anything in that statement you'd like to say anything about um 
I mean, one of the things that stands out to me is, I mean, he, he has a demonstrated history of violence against women. His ex-wife got an order of protection against him for violence. So it's not even just me coming forward and, you know, alone and saying this. I mean, he has a recorded history that the court felt that he was a danger to his ex-wife and gave her this order of protection, which lasted at least several years. I don't know if it's still intact, but, you know, he doesn't acknowledge that part, right? He just says he would never be violent against women. I think the court feels otherwise. Um, And then, I mean, as far as students go, and I don't have any corroboration of this or any real evidence of it, but I've heard since coming out with this story that there were other female students who had incidences with him. Um, I don't really know the details or the extent, but it is something that I've heard. And, you know, he has told me himself about stalking ex-girlfriends and doing the same things he did to me. So, you know, to sit there and pretend that you don't have a history of this and that I am this isolated accuser is inaccurate. Well, I mean, um, you know, obviously some of those things you probably do not have evidence of, but I'm sure some of that is very easy to find evidence of. For instance, the uh, protection order uh, that you were speaking about with his ex-wife, that would be something that could be looked up and looked into. Um, So if this is something that ever did go to court, you could clearly say that, look, that's not hard to find that that is true. Um, But when it comes down to it, I actually have a police report right here. I'm going to go ahead and read some of this off real fast, and then we can fill in blanks as we go. So this is a says uh, the town of Warwick Police. This is New York State Incident Report. Um, This was marked June 23rd of 2018. The time was 1909. Um, The location was uh, in Warwick, uh, I do believe. Uh, It looks like uh, stalking in the fourth degree and harassment in the second degree are both what is written on this police report. So as stated before, Yes, he has stalked and harassed, according to this police report. That is not a guess. So when he says the words, I have not stalked anyone or I have not harassed anyone, that is a utter lie, hands down a lie. That is what this police report says. And as a matter of fact, he should be quite aware of that because this police report is about him. So if we continue down this path right fast, it says narrative uh, as written by the police officers. It says the, on the date and time, Maggie Rose Holmes came into the police department to inquire what steps she can take about her ex-boyfriend, Carl G. Massaro. That keeps making contact with her via texting and driving by her home after being told multiple times it is over and have been broken up for two months now. Um, The officer explained all her options from criminal charges to orders of protection without a criminal charge. The caller said that the ex-boyfriend uses a phone app to make the phone number different from his so he can text and not be traced. Um, All of that sound accurate so far? Yeah. It says, description, boyfriend, stalking and harassing. Yet again, this is written multiple times on the police report itself by the police officers. And then we get back down to uh, additional narrative, which is actually really important in terms of understanding what's going on here. It says, callers asked for police to speak with to ex-boyfriend to advise him to stop making contact or she then will make a criminal charge or get the T.O.P. from family court. The police uh, stated that they did reach out to the ex-boyfriend and had him come to the police department to speak to him about the matter at hand before a criminal charge might be brought against him. The ex-boyfriend said to the officer that he was on the way to the police department. While waiting for the ex-boyfriend, he took it upon himself to go to his caller's home, where she then called police because her father chased him off the property and the officer, uh, the RO and officer uh, Kessner uh, responded. The ex-boyfriend fled and finally came to the police department where the RO asked the ex-boyfriend why he went there when he was told to come straight to the police department. He stated that he was trying to fix things before they got worse. The RO advised he just made them worse. Uh, R.O. uh, spoke to the ex-boyfriend who stated that he was heartbroken and upset, clearly admitted to using an app to change his phone number called a burner so it could uh, not be traced. Uh, R.O. advised, does he understand that's not normal? Um, And Carl had no answer. The ex-boyfriend, Carl Massaro, uh, clearly stated he understood and would not make contact anymore. And he stated he would focus more on his own family issues that he had been neglecting. Um, Further, it says 
stop by home of caller before uh, coming to the police department, like instructed to, fled before police got to location, asked homeowner if he wanted to file a charge for trespass, stated just wants the suspect not to come by anymore. So as stated before in his particular statement, he said that he has never stalked anyone. And as a matter of fact, I'll give it the verbatim so that way I don't misquote here. His actual statement said, I have never stalked Maggie. That is a lie. That is not true whatsoever. Clearly stated and admitted to by himself with the police officer that he did, in fact, set up multiple phone calls through an app. And when he did this, and when it confronted that that wasn't normal behavior by the police officer, he had no response. And so at the end of the day, I, you know, he didn't make a statement, you know, he had nothing to say about that. But he was advised by a police officer and the statement by the police officer, the report says stalking and harassing, clear as day. So to say that he has never stalked or harassed anyone is just a lie, period, hands down. Um, can you maybe talk on that incident a little bit more? Is there something that maybe was left out of that report or uh, was that pretty accurate? No, I mean, that was pretty accurate. That was when I, what we talked about earlier, when he had sent those text messages referencing my boyfriend, that's when I decided to go to the police because you know, he seemed unhinged and I was afraid that he was going to do something to my new boyfriend. And then when I filed this report, they said that they would call him and they would bring him in and they would, you know, basically tell him he needs to stop or he's going to be arrested. And I remember um, I had said to the police officer, I was like, well, when you call him, what do I do if he shows up? Um, and he was like, oh, just call us. And 20 minutes later, he's, you know, banging on my parents' door and I'm freaking out. I'm like, what do I do? You know, I call the police. I'm like, he's here. Like I said, he would be. Um, and then my dad opened the door and basically yelled at him to get off the property and he wasn't welcome there. Um, and he left and the police arrived right after they had just met, uh, missed him. And then he did go down to the police station. Um, is there anything that you want to end this on? Any statements that you'd like to make or anything that you hope people get out of this? You know, I think it's very difficult for women, you know, in or outside martial arts to really come out and say this. And, you know, coming forward, you know, I knew it was going to be difficult when I came forward and said everything just, you know, even on just admitting these things have happened is kind of re-traumatizing and upsetting, but also I have nothing to gain from this and everything to lose, you know, like I'm risking, you know, my own reputation um, and having you know, whatever he says about me putting, put out there. Um, and so, I mean, I didn't really do this for myself. I, I just felt like I was in a position where I knew what he was capable of. And I think that it's my obligation as a woman to at least try to put it out there and hopefully protect somebody else who was made aware. Um, but yeah, I mean, this whole thing has been very difficult and uh, upsetting for me. Um, and I didn't even realize going into it how, how difficult it would be. Um, but I am grateful that you have given me a platform and have you know taken notice of this and that you do this kind of work. And to be fair, I've given you both a platform. I've given him the same opportunities I've given you. I have not tried to be on one side or the other. I've told you both the exact same thing, which was I was on no one's side. And this is an open platform that both of you have the opportunity to share. Um, and if he wanted to come on and still wants to come on and wants to make his statement, he is more than welcome to do so. And I will ask him the same questions that I asked you. And I will dig into the same type of questioning that I dug in with you. Um, I don't think that this is one of those things where I'm on anyone's side, but it is very much a clear case of stalking and harassment that happened. Uh, and I think that what really people need to be aware of is just because you have a black piece of uh, cloth around your waist doesn't give you any type of moral um, high ground for anyone. Like I said before, we all make mistakes. Uh, I think that the power lies in admitting to fault and then moving forward from there instead of trying to deny anything wrongdoing um, and just rely on the fact that as he has done multiple times, the fact that he is a martial arts instructor and has looked up into the community, that that somehow has exonerated him from doing these other things, which it, it just hasn't. Um, you know, the, and I really hope that this isn't something that continues down the path. There's no way of predicting the future. There's no way of knowing what he will do in the, in the future. But I think that understanding someone's history and past goes a long way into understanding what their behavior will be in the future. And 
we have evidence of what we have evidence of. And hopefully that that's eye opening for other people. And then they can make their own decisions. Like if they want to stick with Carl, please do. But like, I'm not trying to hurt the man's business. I'm just trying to make people aware. Like yeah. I hope that at the end of the day, people just make the decision that's healthiest for them. And if they feel like this man has done no wrongdoing, that's just not true. It just isn't true. Right. Um, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to actually sit down and speak with me. So thank you again. I appreciate you. And uh, hopefully you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. I'm Jordan Novak. I'm one of the Rear Naked Chicks, and we hosted Maggie on our po- podcast so she could talk about uh, the abuse she suffered at the hands of, you know, black belt gym owner Carl Macero. And I had also had my own sort of uh, like near miss of a potentially bad experience with him, and and was like warned by a bunch of uh, instructors who were my instructors that basically he had fixated on me and that I needed to uh, be careful and you know, stay away from him. So you were warned by other instructors that he was doing what? That he basically was like asking where I would be, that he was requiring employees to inform him when I specifically would come train there because I I cross trained there. So I was a member of a different Henzo Gracie affiliate. um, And we had a pretty open door policy cross training. We had one like instructor in common and we had opposite day, um, daytime schedules. And I used to train a lot of two a days. So on days that we didn't have daytime classes at our academy, I would go down there and train daytime classes. And uh, at the time, and I, I had no idea. I didn't know any of these people. I was very new to jujitsu. I was told that he very rarely showed up to any classes in the daytime, like never. And the instructor who was my instructor at both Hensel Gracie Warwick and at Hensel Gracie Northern Valley said that he had only trained with him maybe a hand, like fewer than five times in the entire time. And he was a high purple belt, I think at the time, in the entire time he had been training at that academy. And Carl showed up and trained with me several times a week. So that that was already a little concerning. And then my professor had told me that like, you know, he's got kind of a history. There's this whole thing with this girl, Maggie. He had known about what happened because Carl had threatened to come fight Maggie's new boyfriend at his academy. So he already knew that there was like a bunch of weird stuff there. And also he had seen Maggie back when she was like a teenager and was like already kind of weirded out by it. Um, And he basically said like, you need to be careful. You need to stop training there, but also don't let him know that, you know, he asked, I don't know if it was he who asked Maggie. I think he asked Maggie what I should do, like how to handle it. And her advice, I'm not sure if it was him or the other instructor, but her advice was don't let him know that, you know, because Mm -hmm. right now he's just, you know, interested. Um, but then he had followed me into the the locker room that one day. So he did a couple of other things like trying to like see where I was going to go to lunch or like encourage me to go to one place. I'll, oh, I'll be there, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it was just getting more and more. He was, you know, asking people where I would be and then showing up there. And, you know, I would run into him weird places. Like I saw him at the mall in a town I didn't even live in. And this could all be coincidental, but com- like it uh, combined with the fact that my professor had warned me that he w- had noticed his behavior had become odd surrounding me and he was concerned for my safety and that the other instructor essentially in a, it was more of a joking way when he said it, he was just like, Oh, weird, you know, creepy Carl is on to you. Like you, he's, you know, he's making me tell him it's creepy Carl's think, his nickname. <clears throat> Do you think that that particular instructor would speak out against Carl? No, he still works there. Okay. So you think that he would be afraid to speak out specifically because of his job? I think he'd be really upset just to hear that I'm saying like that I'm referring to him at all. But at this point, like everyone who knew something who said that they would be supportive or at least just like confirm that they said what they said when they said it has kind of disappeared because everyone's so afraid of, you know, the big machine that is Henzo Gracie um, that I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to protect myself. Like Mm. I, I didn't say anything that wasn't true. I can back up everything that I said more or less with text messages, like almost everything. Um, so I think- And I've seen those as well. So right. I've, seen those, I've seen those text messages. As a matter <laughs> of fact, something that I stated when I talked to Maggie was when I spoke with everyone's side, because I'm completely fair, as I told you and told Maggie and told Carl, I'm on no one's side, but the truth. Um, but when it came down to it, you and Maggie and um, yeah, basically you and Maggie, because you're the only real ones involved here, but Uh, You were nothing but helpful, nothing but forthcoming with all the evidence and any information that I asked or, or, you know, I had said, hey, I'd like to see. 
Um, it was never like a he said, she said. It was always anything that I had spoken with you guys directly about. There was always evidence of, and I appreciate that. And the main reason that I brought you here was specifically because I wanted you to say your side. Um, <clears throat> and as stated before, I already sp offered Carl to come on as well to speak. Um, I'm not going to say that he refused to come on and speak, but he just didn't answer. And I can see that he read what I wrote. So okay. he's aware that I have offered him the offer to come speak. If he chooses not to do so, that is 100% on him. But he did release a statement. And in that statement, I already went through it very detailed with Maggie on her stuff, but your name is actually on here. And what I wanted to do was just go bullet point by bullet point and talk to you about what his statement has said, if that's okay. Sure. This particular portion is right after it got done with Maggie's portion. It went right into basically just saying your name, which is Jordan mm -hmm. Novak. And the first bullet point on this says, Jordan is the host of Rear Naked Chicks podcast and is in a romantic relationship with Maggie's brother who also trains at RG Warwick along with Jordan and Maggie's friends on the Rear Naked Chick podcast. Is that correct? Um, it was correct when he wrote it. I no longer train at Henzo Gracie Warwick um, because of the association with the Henzo Gracie, like because of this whole thing, because no nothing was done. I can't stand by that. Um, but yeah, I, I was really clear about it on the podcast. The reason I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend is because I was connected with Maggie because Carl was creeping on me and I, I basically reached out to Ian to say, who is my boyfriend, who is Maggie's brother? Hey, can I get in touch with your sister? I'm concerned about this thing that's happening. I want to ask her, you know, her experience. For sure. And I'm not exactly sure how that really even relates to what he's done and the things that we can prove that he's done. I'm not sure why that's important, but he made it a point to make a bullet point. Here. I, I think it's interesting because he's really just confirming like what I've already said, but okay, sure. And, um, the yeah. next bullet point says Jordan... Uh, has never been a student at my academy. I've never been a paying member, but I've definitely been a student. Like Exactly. I and this is something that I went over with Maggie in detail was there is a difference <laughs> between right. saying someone's never a student and someone's never right. a paying member. Now, you might not have ever been a paying member, but if you've ever taken a class there, that would make you a student. Yeah. I And I took, I, I was a regular student twice a week there um, for a number of months. And yeah. Yeah, we, I, I train at a different affiliate. We had a lot of their members would come and train at Warwick for no charge and vice versa. That's pretty common practice in like different affiliates. If you're a member of, you know, a Henzo gym, you go pretty much any Henzo gym, they'll welcome you. Sometimes you'll pay a mat fee, sometimes not, but you don't start a membership. Yeah, there are plenty of students around the world who go to places pro bono. That yeah. is not yeah. new. They do not get considered not a student because they're not a paying member. There's a difference. Right. But with that said, I think that that's important to establish this half truth kind of thing that's going on here, because there was a lot of that in Maggie's statement. Like, for instance, we went in detail about stalking. He said he never stalked Maggie, but we clearly have a police report <laughs> that is labeled stalking and harassment. So that's just he an literally lie. admits to using like a like fake texting app to get around her call blocking he just because he doesn't call it stalking doesn't mean it wasn't stalking exactly it worked well, perception. The, police, the police definitely called it stalking and harassment right. on the police report it is labeled as such but that's the right. half truth kind of thing um but it goes on to the next bullet point where it says jordan has never paid membership dues to my academy nor have i ever been her formal instructor other than her attending a drop-in class at my academy now it says specifically a drop-in class um what are your thoughts about that like a singular one, that's silly. I was there all the time. Okay, so you were there more than once. Absolutely, yeah. And then you you already said that you weren't a paying member, but that, again, yeah. that doesn't yeah. mean- I mean, that's, student. yeah, I feel like, yeah, that's well covered, mm -hmm. sure. Um, it says- I've never I claimed have, anything else. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it says, I have never stalked, stalk is in quotations, uh, Jordan, nor attempted to make any romantic overtures towards her at any time. Thoughts? Yeah. I, and I always stop short of the word stock with him too. Like I, I was very careful anytime, you know, other people would use that word. And I was like, I don't think we quite got there. I think I was lucky in that people warned me. I think he fixated on me. And again, this is just stuff that other people told me my direct interactions with him. Like, it just seemed like he maybe had a crush. Um, the only thing that was fully that I experienced, it wasn't somebody else telling me what had happened that they were concerned about, was him following me into the women's locker room. Which is actually and, his next bullet point here. And since we're going to talk about that, um, I'd like to go ahead and go to that bullet point because I think yeah, that yeah. That's, that seems to be a very important thing to him in this statement. 
um, because it says, uh, while Jordan claimed in a recent podcast episode that I followed her into the women's changing room at my academy, this is entirely false. At no point in my professional career at my academy or any other have I ever followed a woman into a locker room. My program director, instructors, as well as male and female students uh, can attest to our conduct and rules in our school regarding this. No male is allowed in the women's locker room while a female is in the building. If we need to enter the women's locker room to close the academy after all females have left the building, we knock to make sure no one is there. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, he's just lying. Like that might be their their policy, but like this very specifically happened. He asked me about like a piece of furniture that he had purchased for the, sorry, my phone went off. He asked me about a piece of furniture they purchased for the women's locker room, like my opinion on it. It was a, a really thinly veiled attempt to like, have an excuse to be in there with me. I felt super uncomfortable. I told that other instructor at the time, cause I was like, we were going out to lunch afterwards. So like, you know, he, but he's never, I don't know. He'll probably never admit that we had that conversation just cause he's still an instructor. Um, I don't, I can't, I can't go beyond It's Just, he said, she said, uh, I can't prove that one. I guess I made a reference to it. I think if I did, I, I would have, sent you the text message. I went through so many millions of text messages. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know, it happened. Uh, there was one other person who knew that it happened at the time. A couple other people heard me talk about it around the time, whether or not anyone believes that. I don't know, there's so much other stuff that's way more like heavy. I hardly think it really matters at all. I hesitated to even tell my chunk of the whole Carl story. Um, but I thought that it was important just because it was my firsthand experience. And I had, you know, I had personal knowledge that he had this bizarre boundary testing, um, fixation type behavior. So I knew the whole reason I knew Maggie in the first place was because of my own personal experience. And I knew if I didn't say that, that it would be taking away from more credibility for the story. I had no reason to know Maggie other than this was potentially happening to me and other people were warning me about it. So whether or not anybody wants to believe about the locker room. Well, it, one thing I can say, and this is something that I know for a fact because there are files of it, um, is there are a lot of people who quite clearly know that he has a track record of doing things like this. Yeah. I've seen multiple text messages from a lot of different sources of people having full-blown conversations about these things. Um, most of those people do not want to come forward, right. um, which is, I respect that. I'm not going to sit there and try to put out something that no one's requested to put out. Like, I don't think that that's fair to them. I don't think that their stance is fair to victims, but at the end of the day, they right. have the right to make a decision if they want to come forward or not. Right. And the people in those positions, some of them instructors as well, who have decided not to come forward, I truly hope that they understand what they're doing, which is really aiding and abetting someone with a track record of doing things like this. Right. Um, and I, I think that they would really like fight against that perception. But the truth is like the, the consequences of your actions are more meaningful than your intention behind them. If your intention is to stay out of it, like, I'm sorry, but like you were brought into it the moment you were made aware of something bad happening and you had the opportunity to support somebody coming forward and you chose to keep your life more comfortable and keep this person out there and their story intact rather than support the truth that you know is true and mm -hmm. you know help protect other women from this happening again like these people know they don't think they're not they, it wasn't a rumor it wasn't here to say some of them have heard directly from carl some of them have witnessed things directly like it is heartbreaking to me honestly as somebody who was close to some of these people to have to feel that kind of abandonment in this moment of like, we are really, this matters to us. We didn't, you know, he mentioned something about us trying to make money. We stopped making money off of rear naked chicks altogether to try and just sit here in this moment and pay attention to the severity of the situation. We stopped making joking TikToks. We stopped selling stuff. Like we just, we couldn't even handle how heavy all these stories coming to us and just, I mean, not just from Henzo people, but just from the jujitsu community in general, it was just so much for them to just sit back and say, essentially, um, you guys do you, but like, like leave us out of it, knowing full well that 
you know, they were the ones who were the credible like witnesses, that they were the black belts, that there were the men in the room who people would believe. One of the one of the big things that sticks out to me is, you know, and I, there's about three more bullet points left on this page for you specifically. Um, but one of the big things that stood out to me was how adamant he was about not stalking anyone. And even during uh, the bullet points for Maggie, he even tries to uh, define stalking as a as a as a law. He defines it legally through a New York statute, I do believe, off the top of my head. Um, and when he does that, exactly what he did is just define what he did, which was actual stalking. But when it comes down to the rest of these bullet points, I just want to make sure, because I know you're on a limited time schedule today, I want to make sure I get to them. The next one oh, says, sorry. while Jordan claimed in a recent podcast that I showed up, again in quotations, at another academy, R.G. Warwick, uh, where she was teaching a children's jujitsu class on multiple occasions, again, on quotations, offering this in support of the suggestion that I was stalking, in quotations, her. She conveniently failed to mention that my two children were, in fact, enrolled students at this academy at that time, attending the class, and that I was there uh, accompanying them. My children were enrolled there because I live so much closer to R.G. Warwick than I do my own academy. Thoughts? Um, I'm pretty sure I did not fail to mention that his kids were in the class. That was the whole premise of how I met him. Um, but whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it was common for parents to accompany their children to sit in the waiting room. He did not sit in the waiting room. He came on the mats. And that was one of the things that concerned my instructor, which was why even after Carl himself had been banned from our academy over Dave's concerns. He continued to let Carl's students train for a while because I'm not sure. I don't know if it was because he was worried about Carl's like wrath. If he like, well, hold hold that thought because that was that's a something I think is very important. You said Carl was banned from that academy. Yeah, Carl. When when Carl started creeping on me, Dave didn't tell Carl that it was because of me that he banned him. He told him it was because of the Maggie thing and that people were finding out and they were uncomfortable. But the truth was, it was because of me. Um, he didn't at that time stop, uh, Carl's two daughters from training there. And again, I think it's because he just couldn't quite, Dave has a really hard time standing up to people in like the confrontation, that conflict, he doesn't like it. So I, I think it was just this like slow cutting him off. But in any case, this was already at the time when he had been kicked out for being, you know, for having concerning behavior towards me that Dave perceived as concerning. And when he continued to show up and come like into the room and try to insert himself in ways that made Dave uncomfortable, he then kicked him out. This again, was not my call. These aren't my, like I am, I am supporting my own statement this way. This is what the owner of the academy did. There was a reason those girls weren't allowed to train there anymore. And it wasn't because they were in any way uncooperative or bad kids, they're sweet little girls, but their father, did not understand boundaries and was not appropriate with his interactions with the instructor, me. Um, and that was, that was his perception. I don't know what Dave's going to say. Why would Dave say, what's Dave's explanation for why Carl wasn't allowed to train there or why his girls weren't? Because I know the reason, but is he going to admit to it? Like, I doubt it. We I, never know. I mean, we'll see. I don't know. Um, the next bullet um, point says, while Jordan claimed in the podcast that I kept tabs on when she trained, all in quotations, at my academy, she fails to realize that as the owner of an RG Academy, it is quite common for owners to want to monitor any drop-ins, also in quotations, from their schools, especially RG-affiliated academies. I often ask my instructors and program director to promptly advise me of anyone, including male students, drop in from any other schools or if any potential new students prospects come in to train jordan's claims that i showed up again in quotations at my own school on days i didn't teach in order to stalk her is absurd since i found my school approximately 14 years ago founded my school approximately 14 years ago i frequently show up there to do work repairs clean train etc thoughts that simply was not what his instructors had to say about it. Like I, again, I don't know how he runs his school. I don't know him. I'm just some random person. This is what the people close to him told me. He's never here. This is super weird. He's, he's making me tell him when you're going to be here. It's so weird that he's always rolling with you. He never rolls with anybody. 
these aren't, this isn't my, like, I wouldn't have thought it was weird if it was my instructor. It's because of his track record and because of other people who are close to him noticing this behavior is odd and because of his history that it is weird. The behavior in and of itself isn't weird. It's him who has the, you know, the, the history and the intent behind it and the fact that it, you know, according to the people who worked for him, the, according to the people who he was asking, it wasn't everyone, it was just me, or it was specifically that, the, you know, it was very strongly forced on them that he had to, you know, report it and that he always showed up, like that was the weirdness of it. Um, again, these are things that I was told. Those people have to speak for themselves. I can't make their words credible without them. And you know, I really do think it's on them to like admit this stuff. It it's really unfortunate that people are so afraid of him. Like it was to the point that the person who was mainly involved and in between was so paranoid about me basically doing this at some point, which, you know, I guess maybe he knew how this was gonna end up that if he said anything about Carl, he made me delete my text messages about Carl. Like that is odd behavior. That is not something. And I just didn't, I didn't really question it. Jiu-Jitsu is such a weird world. People are so dedicated to their academies and, and there's such a hierarchy. And I was so new to it that I just didn't really question it too much. And I just trusted the people I trusted to keep me safe. And when they told me not to trust him, I believe them. And I do like, I do think they did their part in that way and they did the right thing. But the fact that they just want to be done with it now, they're like, we, you know, we supported you because we kept you safe. And it's like, I'm one person that you cared about. What about all the other girls that you don't know about? Like, you're just going to let this guy get away with it. You're not going to say what you know, because you know, you guys know. The people who are closest to him know. I think even from someone who's an outsider, the one thing that I do know that is irrefutable fact is he did stalk and harass Maggie. The reason that I know that for a fact and can safely say it without it being slander or liable or defamation is I have a police report that I am showing in this video that clearly labels it as stalking and harassment. That is not from me. That is directly from the police officer. And the police yeah. officer's statement also included the fact that Carl did admit to having an app that he did use to change his number to make sure that he can continue to harass Maggie after she had already blocked or deleted or restricted whatever number he tried to get to or from. And when he was asked directly if he thought that that behavior was okay in some way, he had no response. Um, and so at the end of the day, that's not hearsay. That is not slander. That's not liable or defamation of character. That is just a fact. And right. so for me, what I know out of all of this is the all I have is what has been told to me, but I have that. And that is a irrefutable fact that that did happen. And so when he says things like, I never stalked Maggie, that's, that's a bold-faced lie. That is right. an absolute provable lie because at the end of the day, I have proof that that was a lie. And then what's even stranger to me is at the end of this letter, he basically is just threatening to release videos about Maggie to make that Maggie look bad. But what I have to say directly about that before I get to the last bullet point here is even if he did release something that made Maggie look bad, it does not make him look good. It yeah. just makes him look like someone who was filming someone. <laughs> um, but and maybe she is a bad person. I don't know, nor do I give a shit. At the end of the day, I care about what I can prove. And there's a lot of stuff I can't prove. A lot of that stuff is just coming directly from you. It's coming directly from Maggie. It's coming directly from Carl. There's plenty I can't prove. But what I can without a doubt prove is that Maggie was stalked by Carl. That is not even a question. And for him to try to pretend that that did not happen is a bold-faced lie he is just simply caught in. And the question to me at that point is, well, I can prove that he did do that and that he clearly lied on his statement about that. So what else is there that I'm missing that is probably provable as well from people who are in his inner circles that just don't want to speak out? Right. Because at the end of the day, I'm sure there's plenty more. And I've already seen tons of text messages that I wish I could show. But out of respect for the people who have those, who asked for them not to be released, I won't. But to say that he never stalked anybody is just a fucking lie. That is a bold faced lie lie. Because you know, and, and the truth is like, that is one small portion that we can prove. And like, 
how many people are out here having bad things happen to them that they don't have like the the idiot didn't admit to the cop himself that it happened it's hard to prove this stuff especially in an intimate yeah. partner relationship I mean, he, especially he with the kind of power admitted, dynamic he himself admitted to using an app to change his number right. also very verifiable and proven um we also, got lucky that he was stupid enough to admit to his own criminal activity yeah but it wasn't, like, wasn't the smartest but you know, I do want to. I do want to make sure I get to this last bullet. Oh, yeah. point, which yeah, says, no "I have had a total of one text exchange and six IG message exchanges with Jordan in my lifetime. The okay. most recent is in August of 2019. In both text and IG messages, she reached out to me first. None were flirtatious in nature. All were cordial and appropriate. I maintain screenshots of all these interactions. Thoughts on that?" So my favorite part is the I, I initiated the first text conversation because I actually do have texts about this, about how Carl made me message him a video that I had taken at a at a tournament. So this is I already knew that he was creepy at this point and I saw him at a tournament, but I was also told not to tell him. And he basically I, can, I mean, I, I got to look it up in my phone so I can tell you exactly how that interaction went down. So, yeah, so you can see these are the text messages. It's a it's a video sent and a video sent. And basically he asked me, hey, it was a student of his. Can you send me that video? And I was in a group of people. And at that moment, he send he gives me his phone number so I can send him the video in that moment. So I was like, oh, great. Now he's going to have my phone number. But I couldn't, there was just nothing I could do in that moment. And then he sent me a video back that I guess he had taken of me competing. And that was the entire text message conversation. The Instagram was me asking him, can I come train at your academy? This is before I knew anything. And then later on down the road, he responded to some like story that I posted about an artist that I like and tried to strike up a conversation. I kind of just like hearted it and just ignored like the attempt at a conversation. But like, yeah, I mean, we, I knew pretty early on in his, you know, antics, what he was up to. So like, I just didn't engage it. Um, but I, I was, it wasn't like, I was like, oh, hey, Carl, like I asked to come train at his academy because I was told if I wanted to go down there, I should ask him. I mean, that's just like standard practice. Um, and that's it. Well, the final thing here I want to read to you, because this next part, it says documentary evidence, which is all about Maggie. Um, the last part in his letter says legal action, which does include you. And like I said before, the whole reason I wanted you here was because I wanted you to say your side of things with anything that he stated about you. It says legal action. In recent social media postings, Jordan and or Maggie have attempted to argue that if I wish to refute their false claims, I should sue them, in quotation, sue. Uh, these arguments are illogical and demonstrate a complete lack of understanding of how the legal process works in matters of this kind. Uh, it says the one bullet point here says, unlike Jordan and Rear Naked Chicks, I neither have a podcast nor a social media presence that I am seeking to monetize or publicize. Both uh, positive and negative publicity related to this dispute will still ultimately drive traffic to the podcast and social media accounts of the individuals who have made false allegations against me. While Jordan and Rear Naked Chicks podcast uh, purport to be attempting to raise awareness in quotations of issues of domestic violence and coercive control, I would respectfully disagree. I believe in sharp contrast, they are victimizing Maggie and their efforts to virtue signal and publicize their previously obscure podcast and social media presence, while at the same time attempting to ruin my good standing at RGA and hopefully get uh, her back into RGA in the process. If they continue to attempt to make viral the lies they have published about me, I will have no choice but to release the aforeseen, uh, aforesaid uh, documentary evidence, including audio and video recordings that will undoubtedly cause Maggie, not Jordan, embarrassment. If I am forced to prove my innocence, I will be forced to prove Maggie's dishonesty, which I am advised by my attorneys could make difficult or potentially even uh, preclude, uh, preclude Maggie's ability when she graduates from law school to ad be admitted as an attorney. Conclusion. The allegations made against me are false. In hindsight, my error was trying to communicate in attempt to repair a broken relationship with a woman that myself and my children cared for. While I understand and appreciate the importance of giving voice, in quotations, and attention to issues of intimate partner violence and coercive control, this story is simply not one that accurately represents an example of that. All too common dynamic. 
I would respectfully urge you to refrain from amplifying in quotations this false narrative any further as it demonstrates false and will, pers uh, will serve no purpose but to further damage any personal or professional reputation. Thank you, signed CM. So like he touches on a lot of things that are, uh, it's just silly. First of all, our previously obscure social media presence, we have a combined over 100,000 followers. Like we're not obscure. Um, this isn't, this isn't what our viewership wants. This isn't like, we know how to go viral. We're good at it. We do it when we want to. Like we are a primarily like joke skit TikTok social media presence. This was, I think it cost us followers overall. Um, we stopped promoting everything that we did in the moment. We did get more podcast views, but like for a week. You know, this wasn't if anybody who knows what it means to be in social media in the martial arts space knows that it's not like lucrative. It's not easy to uh, to like get people invested in something personal like this. People want light and funny and relatable. This I'm a, I'm a marketing professional. That's what I do. I was well aware that this was going to cost us some of our audience. Um so but you're it was saying important you, did this, you did this in spite of knowing that you, you did this in spite of knowing that it would cost us, you know, a, a portion of our audience. A lot of people are there because they just want to see girls on the internet do jujitsu stuff. And, you know, they don't want us to have opinions or rights or anything. We get a lot of really weird, creepy comments all the time from people who don't want us to even be in martial arts, let alone, you know, stand up to somebody. Um, the idea, like, and the really funny thing is that this is Maggie's story and Maggie doesn't have a monetized social media presence. She did it with us. I simply offered her the platform because she, she had always had some regret about not in the moment when she had like the, the statute of limitations on stuff like stalking that was provable to like actually have something done about it. She, she had regret and she had, you know, she had feelings around it and, and she had doubt that anyone would believe her that we would even be heard. And I had a platform and I, it was very much me being like, if you ever want to tell people your story, like I support you and we'll find a way to get it out there. Like we have a platform, even though it wasn't exactly the right fit. So, I mean, it's silly. It, it was, it's a huge reach for him in general because Maggie coming out with her story would have had to be on her own platform for it to make sense for her to do she's the one in the middle right yeah, the sure. crossfire is on her it's her reputation it's her everything and and to insinuate that we don't understand the legal repercussions she's a law student that's ridiculous if anyone doesn't understand what's going on legally here it's carl like she consulted with professors etc we're confident that her legal professional career is safe like he's just hoping that her level of embarrassment for what he did to her and his ability to put it out there and show the control he had over her will prevent her from further telling her story. And just my personal opinion um, is that I agree 100% with that. I think that it showed when I received a letter from his lawyers that uh, you know the way that it was worded and the way that it was put out there was basically to scare me from continuing to pursue right. the story. I'm not scared of that shit. So I get well, And let me say the most important part here. He never contacted us ever. Not with so a lawyer. Not personally, we never received anything from a letter. A, a, no letter from a lawyer. He knows how much more evidence would come up. If he were to pursue legal action, we'd be able to subpoena all kinds of stuff. He knows. And that's why he's not going to come after us. It, why would you send a cease and desist or anything like that to a journalist who hasn't even covered it yet, rather than the social media platform yeah. that has already- I wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure what the play was there either, mostly because okay. at the end of the day, I hadn't done the story yet. All I had done was I had released the, uh, the reposted, what you guys had already posted. I didn't really give my opinion whatsoever in the description. Actually, I didn't give my opinion at all in the description. I just shared it. Um, all of those things are screenshots and clear evidence of what just, done. it's screen recordings. He's like, they're taken out of context. I'm like the context where before she was like, I fell asleep and it's just some random boring relationship stuff. Like it's the full conversation. Well, I would say if I, you know, like I, I've definitely seen the police report and I'm showing it in this video as well that, you know, that's not taken out of context. Like it's literally him admitting that he has 
set up multiple phone yeah. numbers using an app and he's it, admitted it it's himself. It's just the screen recordings of yeah, so her message. At the end of the day though, I'm, I'm not one to be bullied. I've been bullied and I've been, people have attempted to bully me in this job before, but there's a reason I'm good at my job is because fuck that. Yeah. Um, you're not going to bully me into not covering a news story, especially when it shows a, a history and a track record. And when I'm looking at this particular documentation that I read to you from his statement, it does have lies in that statement, lies that I can clearly prove on here without a doubt whatsoever. And so if those are just the lies that I saw here that I can prove, I'm sure that there are probably other ones. Although I will say this, if I cannot, if I'm not allowed to release the text messages now, um, that doesn't mean that once it goes to court, if I ever did get sued, that I wouldn't definitely be able to release those. Right. They're there. Like you're, yeah. you're an independent third party who's verified these things. Like you don't have any skin in the and, game. And I have nothing to win or gain from here. If I found right. out that you guys were lying, um, then I would definitely be putting why that. Why would we? Oh my God. That's what I meant to to comment on well, the, that, that you, we're doing this to get Maggie back into the Henzo schools. You couldn't pay Maggie enough money to train at a Henzo school after this. Like she would never, it, I mean, it's, it's just, it's silly. Like she would never go train under people who like turned her away when they knew she was being stopped. Like I have actually since sort of tested the waters with other Henzo affiliate, uh, like instructors or like school owners to see if they would even let her train there now that they know the truth. And they still said no. So, I mean, she just would never like morally she's just like so turned away from the entire henzo association because of just how it's just disgusting they all are willing to you know close the door on a girl who was literally the victim of abuse at, uh, from a guy that they know is a crazy person is an abusive and even if they don't know about the way that he was in relationships they have their own different ways that they knew he was a problem so knowing that his victim, you know, was needing a place to train and they turned her away and even said stuff like, oh, it's so sad that he abused her and she can't train anywhere. Nobody made them do that. They did it. Why? To protect themselves from Carl, to do Carl a favor. I mean, practically at the end of the day, that's what everyone did was do Carl a favor. They had the opportunity to be supportive of a woman and teach her, train her in jujitsu so she could defend herself in situations like this, women who are stalked and abused need jujitsu. And when you turn them away in favor of their abuser, you're showing the kind of person you are. You're showing the kind of academy you're willing to run. And it's just always going to bow down to whoever the person ahead of you is, no matter how bad that person is. And that's just sad. And she would never. And now at this point, I would never. I'm not going back. I left my gym that I've been competing for and get dedicating my life to for years. I was the most active member of that gym that I could have possibly been. And I walked away because there was no support. Did anyone else walk away uh, due to this as well? Or were you this? From alone? my gym personally? Yes. Um, I don't know. Not, not yet. I think a lot of people are waiting. Nobody knows what happened between me and the instructor besides me and him. Mm. Um, because I haven't publicly come out and said how unsupportive he was, how much he abandoned me in that time. Like, I, I haven't. I don't know if this is going to be published like this. Maybe people will understand. It was deeply, deeply saddening and disappointing to me because this is a person I considered family. And all it took was for him to privately make a phone call to Henzo and say, like, look, this guy's, he's trouble and I know it. And what she's saying is true. Or just reach out to Maggie and say, I'm so sorry you went through this. Like, anything, any support, and yeah. he just wouldn't. I want to add to that, because I think that this is an important thing. It seems to me, and I could be, maybe I'm misreading, but this is just my understanding. It seems like Carl repeats in uh, his statement about yourself and about Maggie, uh, the same thing pops up twice, almost identical, was that you or her were never an actual student. And I think the reason that he's making that statement is because he wants to separate the situation from his actual teachings and what he does at the academy. This is just from what I'm gathering my own personal opinion. Could be wrong, don't know, but this is just what I'm understanding. This is what how I'm taking it. And if that is the case, and he's trying to make some type of a, a argument that, you know, well, you know, we all make mistakes and that this doesn't actually affect the other, it, it clearly does affect the other because I know of exactly at least three people now who were affected directly about this. One, yourself. 
You left the academy specifically because you were uncomfortable with the way that it was handled. Two, Maggie, I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head the reasons for her leaving or if she was excommunicated from the gym, but she is no longer training at the same facility that she was training at at that time. Um, and so that obviously has affected her. Her person that who was teaching her jujitsu, who she also happened to be dating at the time, is the reason for that being an issue. Right. Um, her current boyfriend now, who was, I guess, removed from a gym, specifically because he was dating her, um, right. that also affected him. So yes, this does affect- so By the way, the association called to verify that he had been told that Henzo banned Ray, Maggie's boyfriend, and that that was a lie. And he confirmed that Carl harassed him and harassed him to kick Ray out and then eventually lied and said that Henzo kicked him out. And then the association, they confirmed this. This, com com this conversation happened. They know that that's true. And now they're acting like we investigated and it, it turned out to not be true. I've talked to those people. They confirmed it. Like the association is just lying. They're just lying. Or And they're asking, like when originally Maggie reached out to ask if she had been banned, they didn't go and ask other gym owners. They asked Carl. They asked the person she was accusing to implicate himself. So they're not trying to look for answers. They're trying to let him off the hook. They're trying to give any kind of plausible deniability. And it's it's just pathetic. And it's honestly like, it, it's not even surprising the more that I look into that whole association, like how many bad things have happened and how many different messages I've gotten about different gym owners and black belts and how little has been done. Like. It's very much, oh, whatever, sweep it under the rug kind of thing. Um, and that, given the intimate nature of jujitsu and the purpose of it, like, it's disgusting. Yeah, I, um, I think that the big thing here is that people understand that just because this was a relationship that happened that started outside of the mat, it definitely shows that it can affect people on the mat. That is 100%, again, a fact. People who were students... And one seemed to be at least a paying member. I think Maggie's boyfriend was a paying member to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, those are people that were directly affected by this who were students at the facility. You were a student. You clearly were a student. Now, whether or not you were a paying member or not, that's semantics. You were a student. You were someone who trained there. You were someone who got belted there. You were someone who got ranked there. Maggie also, I do believe, got her blue belt there uh, at, at one of the academies. So at the end of the day, yes, you were students. If you were not, then how did you get promoted? You can't promote people who aren't students. <laughs> you, you did, so you were a student. Now, you weren't necessarily a paying member, but that's between you and the academy to figure out what your dues should be. And if those dues are zero, then that's the decision of the academy that doesn't mean you're not a student. Now, when it comes down to the way that I'm looking at things here, it completely seems like this has affected people on the mat. And that's where I step in. This is clear cut case of harassment and stalking. There is no question behind that. Not at all. If I ever go to court and have to defend those words, I will be happy to whip out that police report where it says stalking and harassment. And that's what I'm basing my information off of is the fact that I have clear definitive proof of that. And the fact that, you know, I'm not saying I don't believe you and I'm not saying I do believe you, but what I am saying is you yourself have had an experience that made you uncomfortable. Now, whatever the, the details behind that might be, you still were uncomfortable enough because of not just your situation, but the way that the situation was handled with Maggie, which you have stated clearly is the reason that you left the facility. You okay. did not like the reason, the way that that was handled. And so at the end of the day, Maggie's situation directly impacted you and your ability to train at that academy. I really have to go though. I'm so sorry. I'm I, I completely to go understand, myself. but I will close with this. I want to say thank you for taking the time to stand up and to speak with me about the situation. And last thing, because I have to say this, uh, but I also believe this is that at the end of the day, my job is to not get Carl removed from this facility. My job is to not make sure that people don't train this facility. There are a lot of people who did contact me who did say that they did like Carl. And that's fine. You can like the man, but you can't deny the fact that he did stalk and harass this woman. That's a fact. And so if people want to continue to train with Carl, having the facts and the, em the evidence that is provided, that's up to them. It's not my job to tell people who, why, when, and how to train anywhere, but that, hopefully this will give them some information that they can make a better, more informed decision. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that was, you know, Carl can make all of his uh, accusations about why we did this, but the reason we did this was to make sure that the girls who were in that area, who were potential members or who are members now would know who they're dealing with. We wanted to warn 
honestly, a, a girl in particular that we saw there. And then we realized that it wasn't enough to warn one girl that people needed to know. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you again for all the things that you provided for me to be able to put out there to the public. And thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Yeah, thanks for covering it and supporting. Of yeah. course. Bye. So let's end this with some facts. Carl stated that Maggie was never a student. Let's see. She was taking classes. She was learning jujitsu. She was receiving belt promotions. I'd say she was a student. She wasn't a paying member, but just because she wasn't a paying member doesn't mean that she wasn't receiving the service. And she clearly was receiving the service, making her a student. He said he never stalked Maggie. He also said it was improper to categorize his behavior as stalking or harassment. Well, the police report says different. The police report said you committed stalking in the fourth degree and harassment in the second degree. So the police clearly disagree with you when it comes to the stalking and harassing, as they labeled it what they considered it by law. You stated that the screenshots that were posted were heavily edited and do not provide any insight to the truth of what transpired in the relationship. Well, seeing as how those screenshots make it look like it's a very dysfunctional relationship, I would say that's exactly what they do. Furthermore, to add to that, part of those screenshots were the fact that you did set up multiple phone numbers in order to continue to contact her when she did not want to be contacted any further. And in the police report, you clearly stated to the police officer that you admitted to doing just that, setting up multiple phone numbers through an app. So I would say, yeah, I mean, it does show a little insight. In your statement on Instagram, you say that in your personal relationships, you have always understood and deeply honored the importance of clear consent. Well, I would say that setting up multiple phone numbers in order to contact somebody who did not want you to try to continue to contact them wasn't exactly following clear consent. Also, when a police officer has clearly asked you to show up to their police station to speak with you about an issue, and rather than going straight to the police, you go to that person's home, um, I'm pretty sure that you didn't have consent. And as a matter of fact, I know you didn't because they kicked you off the property. So I'd say, yeah, you have a problem with consent issues. Also, in your statement that you gave me, you say you don't wish to violate Maggie's privacy by releasing for the public viewing video and audio recordings that would embarrass her or cause her any emotional harm. But then later on in the letter, you state, if they continue to make viral the lies they have published about me, I will have no choice but to release the aforesaid documentary evidence, including audio and video recordings that will undoubtedly cause Maggie embarrassment. The words that stick out to me are, I will have no choice. That's like the equivalent of saying, why do you make me do this to you? Really think about that thought process of that word choice, because that does not look good. On one hand, you're saying, oh, I, I definitely don't want to do that. But on the other hand, you're saying the lies. Well, like we've proven that you did stalk and harass her. At the end of the day, there's definitely a few things that we know for certain for a fact. One, you did harass and stalk her according to the police report. That's what the police report labeled it as. So to say that you did not stalk or harass her is just a blatant lie according to the police report. The police asked you to show up directly to the police department. You chose not to do that and instead went to her home where you were clearly not welcome. You set up multiple phone numbers using an app so that way you can continue to contact her when you were not welcome to contact her and you did so so that way you couldn't be traced. All of that information is clear as day in the police report. On top of that, I have a full Google Drive that has all kinds of screenshots of text message conversations and eyewitness accounts of things that you've done that aren't even on this particular story that are still pretty damn bad. And the only reason I didn't even post those up was specifically for the privacy of those people who are still in your organization because they're worried that there'll be repercussions that will happen to them because of the organization. Some of these people are instructors. Some of these people are students. This behavior does affect the day-to-day -day operations of the martial arts studio. As a matter of fact, when we're looking at it, there are three people involved who were all students, even though two of them were not paying members, who all were affected by this. Maggie herself, also Jordan, who left because of how poorly this is being handled internally. And then also Maggie's boyfriend who was excommunicated from the organization. There are also other people who were deeply affected by this who are no longer with the organization. So at the end of the day, there are a lot of statements that were released publicly from Carl that just simply are not true. I've covered those statements. I gave you proof as to why those statements were faulty. I gave you clear definitive evidence 
why, yes, indeed, he did stalk and harass Maggie. With that said, it's not up to me to tell people whether or not they should go train at that facility. That's not the point of this story. The point of the story is that people should be informed. And they can make their own decisions as adults. Whether or not they want to continue to join with you or not is not up to me. That's up to them. I truly hope you reform. Truly hope you become a better man. I truly hope that other than Maggie, you no longer stalk or harass people and that you're able to get that under control so that way people in your life aren't affected the same way as she was. This video is completely 100% pro bono. I am not getting paid for this video whatsoever. I have chosen not to add monetization to this video because I think that that's important. Also, when I release my statement that I have this video posted on Instagram, I'm gonna do it as a regular post so I don't make any money off of that either. I'm not doing this for money. I'm not doing this for more followers. I'm specifically doing this because you're trying to make these women out to be liars. You're saying that you didn't stalk and harass her when the police report clearly labeled you as stalking and harassing. With that said, I look forward to reading your comments in the comment sections below. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about this. If you watched the entire thing, kudos to you because I know it was quite the saga and the journey and it took forever for me to put this together. Thank you all for the continued support. Keep the martial arts legit. Things just happen.